So we are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Good morning, friends. Today, on this nineteenth March Sunday morning, the topic of webinar is nailing. So we'll be starting with advanced nailing webinar episode one. This is. And the background of this is uh, formed by IOA. I'll request Dr. Gardegone to brief about this committee and the schedules in front. Good morning to everybody, viewers of Artho TV, viewers of IOA TV, and all delegates all over India and abroad. Uh, respected Srivastava sir, Ram Chadda sir, President-elect, Vice President Atul Agrawal, and Secretary Navin Thakkar, an academic chairman, Dr. Vivek Trikaya, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Santosh Singh, and uh, respected Dr. Sivshankar, a past president of IU, and all faculty members. This is, we are uh, planning a four to five webinars for uh, a difficult part of the nailing, or upper extremity, lower extremity, and also a regional. Uh, this will be a platform to learn for all young uh, surgeons all over India and abroad. And we are planning a very good program in coming uh, months in the April, May, June, and July. So, viewers, uh, it is uh, you are all welcome. And those who are interested, they can interact with the faculty members, those who are present here and deliberating their knowledge. So, welcome all and welcome all faculty, those who have given me a chance to. Uh, the celebrate, uh, we can say, this difficult nailing webinar. So I handed over to Dr. Santosh Singh. He will introduce all faculty members of this present webinar. Thank you, Dr. Vasudev Gargunel, sir, the chairman of the IOA Nails Committee. And I have a privilege to introduce to the learned speakers. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, all speakers don't need any introduction further but for the new surgeons. Uh, the first uh, talk will be by Dr. Ajit Kumar from Mangalore, the reaming principle in the complex fracture. So I think uh, it is. it will be better to start one by one and uh, uh, introduce uh, before their topics. So, may I proceed to Dr. Ajit Kumar? Yes, sir, please. Dr. Ajit Kumar, welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning. And uh, grateful to the IOA uh, Nails Committee for giving me this opportunity. Um, my talk is going to be on uh, reaming, intramedullary reaming in uh, difficult fractures. So, I'll start off with the... Uh, concept of uh, why reaming at all, and then go on to a few situations. There will be some overlap because we're talking about all patterns and all varieties of fractures here. So I will just give a brief outline about the uh, pathophysiology of reaming and uh, some uh, ideas about reamed versus non-reamed uh, nailings. So as we all know, the father of uh, intramedullary nailing is Gerard Kunscher from Germany. And uh, he had a lot of uh, designs and uh, uh, implants right from uh, uh, the 1930s. And most of the current concepts uh, take their origin from this uh, great uh, surgeon. So um, in those days itself, he had uh, used flexible reamers to get uh, a tight fit of his uh, uh, clover leaf uh, type of uh, nails so that there would be uh, better stability of the implant. So somewhere in the middle, uh, the concept of using unreamed nails came in uh, because of certain uh, perceived disadvantages of uh, reamed nailing. And the uh, thought process was that uh, unreamed nails would uh, uh, cause less blood loss. There would be less risk of embolism and uh, in turn, less risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And also mainly uh, less disruption of the uh, Introscious vascularity. So these were the concepts, and uh, for a uh, time period, unreamed nails uh, became popular. 
However, they had certain disadvantages which we might uh, yeah, discuss here. So, because these were unreamed, it was difficult to uh, insert. You needed to plan preoperatively because the canal diameter was of uh, critical importance. Uh, if it was too small, then it would be unstable. If it was too big, then you would get stuck with nail incarceration. So, these were problems. And also the incidence of uh, non-unions and breakages of the implants, particularly the locking bolts were much higher in this uh, nails. So all of us know that the benefits of uh, reaming include uh, the enlargement of the canal so that you get a bigger size, a slightly bigger size of nail with a good nail to bone contact, a decrease in the working length, and obviously a better stability when you use a bigger uh, size nail. So these are the uh, advantages of reaming. Also, uh, there are biological advantages that the reaming products act as uh, internal bone graft. And so uh, it does help in the uh, healing process. However, there are certain uh, disadvantages with reaming. We all know that the endosteal supply uh, gets disrupted. Although transiently, studies have shown that it is restored within about four to six weeks. The risk of fat embolization is there and we will come to specific situations later. The uh, problems of thermal necrosis has been uh, talked about and discussed in the earlier uh, uh, days. And, uh, also, the uh, causes uh, of uh, fat embolism and ARDS with particularly patients with chest injuries is uh, definitely a one of concern. Uh, way back in the 70s itself, Proeta and others had shown us that uh, reaming causes uh, disruption of the endosteal blood supply. However, at the same time, there is an uh, enormous increase in the periosteal blood supply, almost a six-fold increase in the periosteal blood supply. And although transiently there is a decrease or uh, damage to the endosteal blood supply, uh, particularly in the fever, the healing process goes on uninterrupted. So, coming to certain studies, uh, reaming causes tremendous increases uh, in the interosseous uh, temperatures and uh, it uh, varies uh, for, uh, with the amount of force that is used, amount of uh, reaming speed that is used and also the size of the reamers that it is used. Um, so these are histo micro uh, histopathological pictures of the endosteal uh, uh, damage that is caused by reaming. So the other concern in reaming is the pressure uh, increases that occur uh, with this. Normally, in the interosseous uh, pressure is about 30 to 60. The resting pressure is about 30 to 60 millimeters of mercury. But when you open the medullary canal, it shoots up almost... Uh, three to four folds. And uh, the, even the guide wire, when you introduce, there is a tremendous increase in the uh, intraosseous uh, pressures. And uh, reaming also, the first reamer causes the maximum uh, in, uh, increase in pressures. Subsequent reamers do not actually cause that much of an increase. However, the nail insertion can uh, cause, whether it is unreamed or a reamed nail, there is a tremendous increase in the interosseous pressure. So we need to be careful about how we do it. Now, the type of reamer also has a bearing on the complications that can be encountered. So to minimize the adverse effects, one should not use a tonicate. And ideally, you should have sharp and deep-rooted reamers, preferably front cutting, and then small increments of 0.5 millimeter diameter increases would be optimal. Many systems have a 1 millimeter increase, but ideally a 0.5 millimeter increase would be ideal. So sharp reamers, um, small increments in diameter, and no tonicate. These are uh, critical in uh, having a good outcome. So these are all the pressure readings when you actually ream. So the the suggestions are that you ream at full speed, but you advance slowly. And all the time you keep going in and out, withdraw the uh, reamer uh, intermittently so that the heat generation uh, is less. Uh, otherwise, when you get stuck, there is tremendous increase in the 
uh, heat that is uh, intramedullary heat that is generated. So uh, blunt reamer causes more than two to three times the increase in the heat that is produced in the intramedullary pressures. And here's one example that uh, the devastating effect of thermal necrosis that has occurred in this particular patient. Uh, as you can see, the entire uh, uh, diaphysis is, has been affected by over uh, enthusiastic reamer, uh, reaming. So this is one uh, complication that we need to keep in mind, however um, low the incidence may be. This is something that we need to keep in mind. So coming to the complex uh, fractures, uh, the reaming in complex fractures, what do uh, what are these complex fractures? So it could be segmental fractures, comminuted fractures, open fractures, a polytraumatized patient, pathological fractures, and also uh, the main concern, a patient with chest injury. <clears throat> so coming to uh, the segmental fractures, we always worry about the mid-segment. What happens to that when you are reaming? So either you hold it, with a uh, clamp or a uh, pointed uh, reduction clamp, or you uh, gently pass it with pressure, not too much of reaming, what you call minimal pressure reaming, and you push it across. If the canal is tight, definitely you need to hold the mid-segment while you're reaming. So there will be cases uh, shown later in the other talk, so I will not uh, dwell in depth, but you push through, uh, the intermediate segment or you hold that segment and ream gradually uh, if it is a tight canal and you need to pass an appropriate size nail because we know that one of the fractures will definitely go in for delayed union in a segmental fracture. So you need an optimal fit for the uh, nail in this situation. So here's an example of how to hold the fragment while you're reaming. Coming to comminuted fractures, <clears throat> Ideally, um, there would be a lot of uh, uh, soft tissue damage also in this situation. So, so just push it across that uh, comminuted area or there is something, the low pressure reaming is also acceptable. But generally, when there is such a, a blowout sort of a situation, the reamer goes in easily without one having to ream through. You can just push it down the uh, comminuted area. So... Hence, the diameter is not a major issue. It, the diameter may be an issue proximal or distal to the comminuted area. So very carefully, you push the reamer across such an area. The reaming also depends, the pressure of reaming also depends where, how comminuted it is. Severely disrupted or dislocated fractures, the pressures are much less because there is a dissociation or disruption of the Pressures. As you can see, <clears throat> there is high pressure when in an intact sheath is there. But if it is comminuted, this high pressure area uh, is very, very minimal. So that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind. What about pathological fractures? A lot of uh, worries are there about pathological fractures. Many series have published a higher incidence of uh, uh, pulmonary embolism or even uh, cardiac arrest uh, perioperatively. Uh, there are uh, some publications where there is a high incidence, but in Pieter Gionidis' uh, series of almost 30 cases, there were no problems. Um, so, but the important thing is, since these people have a limited lifespan, you don't have to ream to the very maximum to get a, a very, very thick nail. You could, uh, to up to the point where some sort of minimal chattering occurs, you uh, may stop the reaming and put on an appropriate size nail so that the whole aim of this uh, surgery in pathological fractures is uh, improving the quality of life. It is not the longevity or the union of the fracture. It is improving the quality of life. So we, one need not go in for the largest diameter of nail in such, such situations. So hence, what has been suggested is reduce pressure reaming in this and which reduces the chances of uh, embolization due to pathological uh, tissue in these sort of situations. So what are the conclusions? In uh, infection, whether it is closed or open fractures, no difference between reamed and unreamed nails. We are not talking about the 
extremely contaminated nails here, I mean, uh, situations here, like a farmyard injury. Uh, but type, uh, say, say up to 3A, there may, there's no significant difference between reamed versus unreamed nails. And uh, reamed nails are better as regards time to union, non-unions, and reoperation rates. Thoracic injury is one major determinant of pulmonary complications, and it is not whether you ream or not. In, if there is lung contusion, if there is uh, lung tissue damage, lung parenchymal damage, then one should not proceed with ream nailing. You do damage control in that scenario and then later on undertake the definitive fixation. In patients with severe head injuries, ream nailing did not worsen the outcomes. That's the consensus from current literature. So in uh, pulmonary contusion or parenchymal damage, do not Ream, wait, do damage control, and then take it up. So the take-home message is intramedullary reaming is gold standard for uh, current practice of uh, nailing of uh, long bone fractures. One has to advance slowly, but ream with full RPM and go in and out. Do not get stuck and do not increase the thermal uh, necrosis by doing that. Use sharp reamers once again so that there is minimized uh, increase in the temperatures. Withdraw frequently, as I mentioned. And one very important uh, thing, be very wary of reaming in patients with uh, lung parenchymal injury. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajit. <laughs> it was a wonderful uh, information on reaming principles. Any questions from the faculty members? I would like to ask you, Dr. Ajit. Yes, uh, sir. Any incidents you yourself faced of fat embolism during reaming and how did you manage that? Yes, sir. We had, I think, uh, we have also uh, put it up in one, one of the webinars. This was a patient uh, who had, uh, uh, on day one, there was, uh, 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 there was uh, rib fractures. CT did not show any lung contusion on day one. So because he had come early, in spite of the rib fractures, we went ahead and uh, nailed him. But subsequently, um, on the third day, he started dropping saturation and became breathless. And a repeat CT showed that he had uh, uh, parent parenchymal injury. And um, he had to be ventilated and he went through a very rough course. And eventually he survived uh, after being on a ventilator for about eight days, I think. And uh, this was one scenario where, although the pre-op CT was normal, multiple rib fractures, I think he had about six rib fractures, there was minimal uh, hematrosis, um, he went on to have uh, problems. But otherwise, in lung contusions, we do not uh, routinely na ream them, nail them. Now. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gaur. Uh, may I ask one question, Tandak, sir? Gaur, sir, welcome to webinar. Most welcome. Yeah, Gadigoni sir, please go. Oh, yeah. Suppose yeah. if you have a polytrauma patient already had a uh, pulmonary uh, insert, so how far we have to wait for the surgery after recovery? And uh, do you do re uh, reaming while doing a second surgery? Because the patient has survived from the pulmonary insult, and then ultimately we have to take the patient for surgery. Yes. Whether we should ream or not. So after I, how many days we should take the patient? No, uh, if he is in that uh, phase of acute uh, inflammatory response, then we wait for that for first window of five to seven days. If all the parameters are normal by then, including your lactate levels, uh, we have gone ahead and uh, nailed them, sir, including bilateral femoral fractures. Of course, with the uh, understanding that having done one side, if things uh, deteriorate, then the other side, we may delay it for the next time. But I think most often we have proceeded with both. Uh, in, I'm talking about bilateral femoral fractures, not just uh, femur and tibia. I think Dr. Vivek uh, may be in a better position to answer that in a major center. Yes, yeah, sir. We, yeah, we, we do routinely nail, nail the patients who are having an embolism or an ARDS. And uh, we even ream them even in bilateral, as you have said. As you have rightly said, we have to wait for the objective biochemical parameters to look at, which is paramount is the lactate levels, the ABG levels. 
And if both of them are less than four or even two less than, because now you are making sure that your reaming is not going to exacerbate any of the ARDS or lung contusion injuries, then you can go ahead and do the nailing part with reaming. Okay. There's not a contraindication. As was rightly said by Dr. Ajit, it's not the reaming which causes the embolisms and the ARDS. It's that amount of the lung contusion, the ALI, acute lung injuries, which are the main reasons why these go into issues of ARDS. Yeah. Sir, even in cases, if we fix the femur, it will decrease the chances of the fat embolism later on. So in my hospital, it is a policy that uh, if patient had got insult of the chest, uh, to then uh, ICU intensivist uh, uh, counsel the patient regarding the operations. And then we fix even in the uh, unconscious uh, cases, we fix the femur and so that the further uh, insult of the lungs can be reduced by the fixation of the femur. And mobilization and physiotherapy also can... Yeah. Yes, 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 sir. Thank you. Gaur, sir, you are going to comment something. Yeah. See, uh, the patient who does not have chest injury and a fractured femur, um, the timing uh, is controversial. Now they say for damage control orthopedics, you have to fix it within 48 hours. Whereas, uh, if you see, uh, in my experience, when we used to nail them, and Campbell mentioned that, after five to seven days, as Dr. Ajit has mentioned, the incidence of ARDS of fat embolism was much, much less. Then, doing it acutely, and it is, it is a problem in comminuted fracture to nail it because of muscular problems. So waiting would not harm. That is what I feel. Just, just to say something regarding this, there is no literature in the world to say that delayed fracture fixation in an isolated nailing of the femur leads to any further issues of fat embolism or so. There is no literature because it's mostly in the developing world that we see this. There, the developed world is is analyzing whether to do it within six hours or 12 hours. We had done a study regarding the same procedures where we managed and tried to see the biochemical markers of all these patients who were having an isolated nail, femur nailings done. We had around 50 cases of them for less than seven days or less than two days and beyond two days. And this was published in Indian Journal. We managed to see their all the biochemical markers of endothelial growth factors, transforming growth factors, and whether the causes leads to delayed union or leads to increased chances of embolism. And in our cases of 50, where we all measured all their biochemical markers, there was no difference in their union rate, oblique, any of your chest problems. So, this was one of the first studies measuring the exact in serum biochemical markers of VGF, TGF, and fibroblastic growth factors along with interleukins in a young acute case as vis-a-vis -vis a delayed case as Dr. Gore has pointed out. Shiva said you are... My question to Vivek as well as Ajit, is there any role of making a rent, small hole in the distal femur when you are doing the reaming to let out the pressure? Yes, sir. this has been done in the past. Experimental studies were done and uh, not much difference really in the outcomes. Um, even I don't know whether the studies uh, included bilateral femoral fractures. Our biggest worry is these uh, patients with bilateral femoral fractures. But uh, we haven't routinely done that. When the papers first suggested long back, we used to put a Steenman pin and uh, just make a nick, I mean, a uh, uh, hole at the distal end, like when you do a distal locking. But uh, afterwards, we just gave it up. We never, uh, I don't think current literature supports that. Okay. Any incidents you faced where the canals were just unremable? They're just blocked? You mean with the, the uh, tight canals or? Yeah. Tight canals or unremable canals where, where the? Uh, no, sir. Was... We. Actually, when we started nailing in the 90s, a lot of times we found, especially in the subprocatric area, some of the times we used to get stuck 
and i used to say that these are localized um, uh, osteopetrosis i mean we encountered many cases where we just could not go down the canal but that was only localized okay uh, the other thing is narrow canals is actually poor planning again in our earlier uh, years it it happened because we are very enthusiastic about nailing every case um but otherwise we plan and if there is any uh, indication that the canal is very tight then one of the some of the indian companies have an eight size nail so we keep that handy and then proceed okay so with that uh, we move on to the next uh, topic um we welcome uh, dr shiv shankar for his talk on nailing in intraarticular distal femur fractures welcome sir thank you uh, you can see my uh, slides yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yes. thank you so i'll be talking about intraarticular fractures of the distal femur because uh, uh, a extra articular fracture definitely in the distal part of the femur even in the lower third of the femur a supracondylar nail or a distal femoral nail is the treatment of choice but i am in this talk dealing with uh, intra articular fractures in this area this is a young lady with a intra articular fracture c1 type of fracture i have done the nailing long time back sometime in 2010 or 11 and this is at the time of implant removal and after the implant removal you can see that there is hardly any scar over the thigh a small incision for the locking and on the knee for insertion of the nail intraarticular fracture the fracture site can be felt through the small incision taken over the knee and you can reduce the fracture and fix them and do a close percutaneous nailing in these cases another elderly man little more complicated here you can see the intraarticular element is simple but the supracondylar combination is there again percutaneously with the help of clamp we reduce the fracture then did the supracondylar nailing again this is done in 2006 and did the function at 6 weeks time the patient had a good knee function already and this is the wound and this is at the time of implant removal at 4 years you can see that the fracture has consolidated beautifully and patient had a excellent outcome little more for the complicated a complete uh, compound fracture to begin with with lot of combination in the supracondylar area i had to get a nail with only two holes done because if the third hole was there it would have come at the fracture site so i got a special nail done with only two holes and uh, this is the immediate uh, uh, post operative picture i advised him bone grafting at 6 weeks time but the patient never turned back and he only came after 2 years with this union with full function subsequently his implants were also removed this is little more complicated intraarticular fracture of the proximal uh, in uh, distal femur as well as fracture of the proximal tibia a floating knee injury where i have used the supracondylar nail both for the femur as well as the tibia this is one month post operative this is 10 weeks post operative and the fracture united without any problem coming to much more complicated cases this is a case of fracture of the distal femur badly comminuted with intraarticular extension there was a pofa element and there was a split vertical split of the fracture of the patella also which i really missed in pre operatively during the surgery i could feel that and i had i fixed that in during the surgery with two transfer screws this is the immediate post operative picture you had to play jigsaw puzzle with this fracture you have to open medial parapetalar incision i had taken then i opened the fracture put back all the fragment together then fix temporarily with kys then after fixing the uh, intraarticular fracture properly then i have done the nailing by taking proper incision proper entry you can see the incision and the function at 4 four, 4 four months time this is a 3 months post surgery and this is a 9 months patient had a excellent flexion under 2 and 1/2 years this is fracture has consolidated and had the remo removed the implant patient had full function of the knee joint with this bad intraarticular fracture another compound fracture to begin with patient was referred from a distant place and again i used the compound fracture itself and uh, it took the incision covering that part and i had again 
put back all the fragments together and then I have made an entry for the nail. Basically, you have to fix all the fragments with KYS temporarily and take a, uh, make a hole for the nail. That is very, very important. And once you make a hole, the fragment should not get separated. That's also very important. Then you can put the nail and this is at four months time, the patient had about 70 degrees of knee flexion. And by the time the fracture consolidated and healed, he had about 110 to 120 degrees of knee flexion. So this is after the implants have been removed in this patient. Sometimes the fragments will be so small. Again, one more compound fracture to begin with, badly comminuted distal femoral fractures. Again, I, I could not even pass few screws in such a, such a bad fracture. And I had to just put few KYs and leave it there. And patient had a stiff knee at the end of the union. But uh, during the implant removal, we did the release of the quadriceps. The adhesions of the quadriceps are released from the distal femur anteriorly, and the patient had a about 90 to 110 degrees of knee flexion after the surgery. So you have to take in comminuted intraarticular fractures, incision either medial parapetalar or lateral parapetalar. Wherever there is more comminution, I take the incision on that side. That's my simple funda here. Uh, majority of the cases, I take a medial parapetalar incision. One more case, again, you can see that such a bad comminuted fractures, you have to put all the fragments back in position. That is the basic uh, crux of the treatment. So you cannot do this with a bad C2, C3 type of fractures with just a close type of uh, nailing. You have to open, put them back and do the nailing. This another case, again, you can see the combination with the bilateral HOFA in this patient. And uh, this patient, again, I have treated with a the supracordial nailing, again, with the, the fragments were too small where I have used KYS. And this is at around 13 months the, when the patient had fairly good range of motion, about 100 degrees of flexion he had. And uh, this was the fracture showing union in this patient at that time. This X-ray, this is an extra articular fracture. This X-ray I borrowed from Dr. Gadegon. And why I'm showing is if you respect the biology, union will happen without any problem. Close nailing has been done. There is hardly any bone anteriorly as well as medially you can see in this patient. In spite of that, the fracture unites in due course of time and the patient will have excellent outcome. So respect the biology, biology union will happen. Again, one more case of badly comminuted distal femoral fracture. Again, I, this is the intra-articular, uh, intra-operative picture showing the combination. These are some of the clinical picture showing KY temporary fixation so that it will not come in the way of the nail and then doing the nailing in this case. So you can see that there is hardly any bone medially because of the combination, there's only bone was all pushed to the lateral side. This is the immediate post period. If you see the alignment, alignment will be good. But if you see there is a gap medially, if you use a plate with such a large gap medially, there is compressive forces working and that will lead to failure of the implant. So for that purpose, you have to either put bone graft there or you have to put a medial plate. But whereas when you are using a nail, the compressive forces will get shifted laterally and the outer side will be the tensile force will be working. When you insert a nail, the compressive forces get shifted laterally more towards the center of the bone or along the biomechanical axis and the tensile forces get minimized. So that is the reason why a intramedullary implant is at least four times more stronger than an extramedullary implant like a plate. So this is one of the reasons why I like to use nail in all these cases. You can see with this lot of combination and as, as well as gap medially, in spite of that gap, if the alignment is good, the nature will take care of that and the fracture will unite in due course of time without any trouble. This article, I wish everybody should read. This Anderson article in 2009, they talk about the amount of callus. When you use a stiff plate, the locking plate on the lateral aspect, there'll be minimal callus formation on the medial side, and there'll be no callus formation underneath the plate. At about 10 weeks or uh, 12 weeks time, there is zero millimeter cube of callus formed medially. When you use a nail, Nail is like a dynamic implant. It's like a elizero. There is minimal axial micro motion which is happening 
that helps in throwing lot of callus. And another important aspect is this callus is not only on one side, it's global all around. So you can see with a plate, minimal callus only on the medial side until after long duration of time. But whereas with the nail, you see secondary type of callus all around in the immediate post-operative period and much more earlier time than with a plate. This is the reason why we all should switch over to nail. And nailing is definitely a good option. Yeah, I have shown quite good number of cases where in a badly comminuted C2, C3 type of fracture also, I have been using and getting good results. So to have some dynamization underneath the plate, this spar locking cortex principle has come into market but somehow it has not taken up because of the costly nature of the implant. This is not very popular at this stage. So this is one of the case of a power locking cortex where there is minimal dynamization happening underneath the plate between the screw and the bone. Nowadays, we have got multi-locking nailing. Earlier, when we used to do the nailing, there used to be bell effect in the distal femur and we had to, we were only doing medial lateral locking. And in such cases, to avoid the bell effect, we had to put the blocking screws. But with the availability of multi-locking, multi-directional locking available, that problem has been solved to a great extent. And the use of blocking screw is very, very less in the distal femur nowadays. And again, because this is a dynamic, nailing is a dynamic uh, fixation, huge amount of callus, secondary callus forms all around without any problem. These are some of the reasons why I use prefer nailing. It's a stable construct, centrally placed in implant. It's a biological fixation, minimal soft tissue damage. Biomechanically, it's much more stronger, as I said earlier. A strong distal fixation in osteoporotic bones is possible with four to five screws with multi-locking nail available. Reliable bone healing can be predicted in these cases. Nail has equal axial resistance and comparable torsional resistance against uh, when you compare them with the plate. It obviates the need for medial plating or bone grafting, medial bone grafting. As it reaches up to the lesser trochanter, it has a long working length. And because of this long working length, again, the stress over the fracture site is minimal and the chances of implant failure compared to a plate is much more less. This is the sort of the nail I have been using for the last seven, eight years. Since 2016, I'm using this. This is a special locking screw within the nail. There are threads within the nail in the distal locking hole, and these locking bolts can be passed, locked, which gets locked within the nail. So the medial lateral or movement of the nail happening over the interlocking bolt has been minimized to a great extent. Here I'll be showing some of the cases. These are the cases come from collection of Dr. Amit Ajgaokar from Mumbai, Dr. Jaimin Washi from Ahmedabad, and myself. So we share all our cases together for the benefit of showing uh, for academic purpose. This is a distal femoral fracture where I have used a supracondylar nail. Uh, again, this is the three locking bolts I've used. The patient refused to come for follow-up and actually recently he had to come for some other purpose. He had a sore over the one of the middle toe. So for that purpose he came and he was not ready for the x-ray, then I had to get it, uh, get a free x-ray done for the femur. And this, we, you can see that the fracture has consolidated very nicely. Patient is able to walk comfortably. This video is available on the YouTube, multi-lock supracondylar nailing, in that the same person's video I have used to show in the YouTube. So he had this uh, bandage you can see on the left middle toe. For that purpose, he had come and I have taken the x-ray. Another hefty lady with an oblique fracture, I did a encirclage wire in the center at the fracture site. I will not show the encirclage wiring, but you can see the clinical picture. This is after a month's time. You can see that the uh, I, I didn't do the proximal locking also as the nail was snugly fitting and it was also already jetted out from the uh, pyriformis fossa. And this is at our nine months time patient had an excellent outcome with good uh, union of the fracture. This is the patient walking because of the knee virus and the obesity, she is walking with a waddling gait. Otherwise, she is not having any problem with the uh, supracondylar nailing. 
another young patient with a polytrauma that's restrict only to the femur as the fracture was comminuted what i did here was i did a nailing first i did a supracranial nailing and, and percutaneously i applied a, a locking plate also by the side so that i'll get back that length as well as i will not do unnecessary collapse and shortening of the femur the patient was put on a knee brace uh, frame like this i always keep all my knee patients operated with a 90 degree position the reason is getting flexion is not at all a problem if you keep it in 90 degree position if you keep the leg straight and it is extended getting back the flexion is very difficult so it's always better to put the knee at 90 degree whenever you operate whatever the method you operate you can put the patient on a 90 degree frame like this and the getting flexion as well as extension will be very very easy this is the immediate post operative picture this is follow up picture and this is at around 4 months time you can see full function of the knee and the patient was able to walk comfortably this is the picture i have got at 9 7 months time on the right side i have done the surgery for the femur on the left he had a bicondylar fracture of the tibia there is little valgus in that area but right side femur united beautifully well this is another badly comminuted supracranial fracture with a interarticular extension again in this case we had done a, a supracranial nail multi lock nailing and with one proximal locking you, all these cases if you see the nail goes up to the lesser trochanter we use minimum of 36 cm of nail nowadays another extra articular fracture distal femur again treated with a nailing and this after one year with beautiful consolidation and full function of the knee joint this dr amit ajgaokar's case intertrochanteric fracture fracture shaft of the femur and condylar fracture of the distal femur all have been tackled with a supracondylar nail with a dhs additionally and this patient had a uh, the middle fragment which was rotated was derotated and kept back in position after some time this is the sort of the nail he uses there is no locking option it means the uh, locking bolt doesn't get locked within the nail here this is a different type of nail he uses at the patient at 6 months had full function and this is at 18 months you can see patient having full function of the knee with full consolidation of the all the fractures without any problem either to the patient or to the surgeon another fracture again a distal femoral fracture the ct scan uh, 3d reconstruction showing intraarticular element unfortunately the 3d reconstruction did not show the hofa fracture after fixing the uh, distal femur with the femoral fracture with this multi lock nailing this is a sort of bolt which can be compressed from both the sides so this is not a cancellous screw it's a bolt which can be passed through this nail so on from either side you can compress especially if there is a intraarticular fracture this is very very useful and a proximal locking has been done and on table we could recognize that there is a hofa fracture hofa element so we have fixed that with a just a, a, a cannulated cancellous screw which is passed from the side in the from the femoral canal uh, femoral uh, distal femur not in the from the articular surface so this is all the incision which has been taken to fix this bad comminuted fracture with a hofa element this is immediate post operative picture showing nice uh, alignment and nice reduction of all the fragments this is a follow up picture this is at 7 months when the patient had come last the patient is walking comfortably this is the clinical picture at 7 months when the patient was walking another similar fracture again treated in a similar fashion again went on to unite without any problem with good outcome as you can see this is at around 9 months time when the patient had beautiful outcome with the knee function a segmental fracture of the femur again treated in similar fashion again went on to unite with a good outcome very distal femur fracture if, if as long as you are able to put two or three screws then it is usually it's uh, unite without any problem uh, like arjuna you have to keep the nail in the distal fragment in the center both in ap and lateral that is the crux of the whole treatment in this case this is at the time of fracture consolidation at one one and a half years time this is the full function of the knee so to conclude i can say that there are some cases which are very good indication a double fracture or a segmental fracture or a hefty patient with a bilateral fracture femur is a good indication for 
supracondylar nailing. Then uh, again, this is the fracture shaft femur with a uh, condylar fracture of the distal femur treated with that. Fracture neck femur with fracture shaft femur, again, you can use two implants instead of using one implant, giving both respect to the fracture, the neck as well as the fracture shaft. You can do the supracondylar nailing as well as the DHI from the top. Floating knee injury, again, with one set of implants from one incision, just from one infrapatellar approach, you can insert both the nails and you can get away with this one set of implants only. If there is a process is proximally, if the patient has distal femur fracture, again, you can use a distal femur nail. Or even if there is a knee processes, if the knee processes has a, a space for you to allow the nail to be passed through the notch, then again, in such cases with a peri implant fracture, you can use this uh, nail. So what is important is perfect reduction of the joint. So you have to open and do put the uh, all the fragments together by jigsaw puzzle. Correct the alignment. That's the reason why we prefer to use longer nail up to the lesser trochanter. And you should be, your nail should be passed only in the distal fragment, in the center of the distal fragment. Don't look at the close reduction and passing the guide wire across into the proximal fragment. Only look into the distal fragment and keep your guide wire in the center of the distal fragment, both in AP and lateral. Then only your alignment will become correct. A solid stability and disturbed healing can be given with a supraglottal nailing. Early function of the knee joint can be observed in all these cases. So, friends, supraglottal nail is a very versatile implant coming back in a big way with the complications of the plate nowadays being now known to everybody. Now, definitely, supraglottal nail has more space for you in the, your armamentarium. When I see a extra like this, a badly comminuted femoral fracture with supraglottal fracture, the first thing which comes to my mind is to do a supraglottal nailing. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Shiva, sir. Wonderful display of nailing principles for difficult uh, fractures of femur and all complex situation as well. Uh, any questions from the faculty members? Uh, Shiv Shankar, sir. Yes. Uh, actually, you have done a wonderful job showing a number of cases. Actually, probably you have a number of uh, volume is much more about the intraarticular fracture nailing. My question one, the restoration of the articular surface by open reduction and plating in view and against the nailing, what is your experience and ultimate range of movement at the six month follow? Uh, whether I am biased or not, I am not sure. But uh, my results with the intra articular fracture of, with, of the femur is far better than even extra articular fractures with the kneeling. So I feel that uh, probably our expectation in such bad fracture is less. And we feel that we have uh, won the battle. That's probably the one reason. But definitely, as I shown, majority of my patients have regained about 120 degrees of knee flexion. That is not at all a problem, even with C2 and C3 type of fractures. So, and uh, the problem with plating is, uh, we, unless the there is a not much of combination medially, only a lateral plating is good. Otherwise, with little combination also medial, we have to add bone grafting. We have to put one more plate. There are so many things. And we see a lot of complications uh, uh, with the plating. Unfortunately, or fortunately, the number of cases people do with nail is less. That's why probably I am not seeing so many cases of complication also. That could be also one of the reason. But people call me to do nailing in such cases. That's the reason why I got a large series of such fractures I have treated with nailing. Dr. Shankar, I have uh, two questions for you. The first one, do you still uh, apply the plate in some cases? And if uh, you are doing plating, then how you decide in which cases you have to put the plate and you have to put the nail? I'm more comfortable in putting a nail rather than putting a plate, one. And between 2006 to 2012, I was using plate. And I've done quite a good number of plate also. But uh, again, after reading the Anderson article, though it published in 2009, I read that article in 2012. And once I read that article and I have shifted back uh, again to nailing and I have not repented. So you are, presently you are uh, using the nail in all the conditions? 
yes as if it is nailable yes definitely i'll nail it yeah. welcome tanna sir for the webinar welcome sir hello yeah good welcome. morning sir good morning sir good morning everybody good morning good morning sir so chandak sir yeah sir, please sir. Sir. Sir, want to present? Uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. After this, we'll be taking uh, Dr. Tanna sir's so, presentation. So you have my video presentation, ne? Eh? Yes, sir. I'll just share this. So, uh, yeah. It was sent yesterday. Uh, the I'm not PPT, but a video, which yes. I have taken on the Zoom now. Yeah, I'll just just share and see whether it works. It will work. Only why? Anyway, why she will give now? <clears throat> I am on the net. I am on the net here. Sir, no, sir, probably I have to talk. Yeah, yeah, it is just starting. Yes. The video is starting. I think this. No, no, it's just starting. Hold on. Okay. We couldn't delete this earlier part, which we were just trying to set it up. Navin couldn't do that. Okay. 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 We'll just wait for that. By that time, any question? Uh, Dr. Shiva uh, just finished the talk on uh, distal femur nailing procedures. Yes, Dr. Chandak, I want to <clears throat> make a comment and a question. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Distal femur fracture has been very difficult to treat. We are barely able to hear you, Gaur, sir. Possibly you are... Uh... There are some issues with each speaker. Bandwidth uh, appears to be a bit uh, low. Gaur, sir, you can switch off your video. You are not audible. Having very good results in the and the angle blade play for that. There is some problem with the audio, I think, uh, in between. So, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, hear yes, me now. yes. So, when LCP came, uh, Shivshankar, everybody moved to LCP fixing all these fractures. Yes, yes. And uh, the standard nail, nail came and then it went off. Then, multi lock nail came and again it is coming back. Yes. So, in extra articular fracture or C1 type of a fracture, Uh, I think uh, again, I'm not able to hear. Uh, I, you are propagating. Uh, it does not hold well. You have to put the screws uh, away so you can hold it. So, do you think uh, the multi lock nail will, will be more commonly used in the future? Yes, definitely. I have heard your question partly because I couldn't hear totally. But even then, I can say that uh, definitely the supraglottal nail will come back with the venegans again. And uh, now we all know every procedure will be used very frequently whenever it comes new. And once we know the complication, now we know that where to use it, where, how to use it, and over a time, we all know the trips and uh, tips and tricks of the trade and that will have its own place in the market. That's what I feel. But definitely nailing is a far, far better option. Biomechanically, it's better, stronger. It's not that I don't want to say that plating is bad. No. If you do plating, it requires medial plating also, bone grafting also. So additional procedures which are required usually with a plating can be avoided if you are doing a proper nailing. Doing nailing proper is also very important. Thank you. Sandak, sir. Yes, go ahead. Share the screen. Yeah, I'm just sharing the screen. So, in conclusion, it is better to have expertise on the uh, procedure, not on the implant as such. Correct.
I have shown three types of nails. We three people use different type of nail. I use one company, then uh, Amit Ajgaoka uses different, and Dr. Jaimin Washi uses third variety. So uh, there are varieties of nails available. Recording, please. Technique is important. Yes. Hey, you are able to see the screen now? Slide. Yeah. Yes. And the mouse will have it. This is slide. राइटिंग अपर वन फोर्थ junction to lower 3/4 junction these junctional fractures are comminuted unstable subtrochanteric fractures at the junction of the it and the shaft are very unstable only in nail i strongly feel such comminuted fractures should be plated along with the nail so this is a combination which is far more safer occasionally it may be an overkill but still this is the treatment of choice only nailing is unstable in such comminuted fractures now you can see this fracture which has been nailed five months have passed by non union so that's the reason why you had to put in a sub supplementary plate and that is the Hello. one which ultimately it held up after four years so if such a fracture on day 1 when the proximal hold of the implant is very poor lower hold is decent this fracture is the one which i feel i'll augment it on day 1 comminuted and i'm not talking about the transverse fracture comminuted fracture in this situation junctional fractures are unstable only in nail more non union chances overkill it may heal up if you think that you don't need it you may not do it but the safety situation is you put in a plate and there is a much better chance of healing for this fracture as you can see this fracture on day 1 i had put in a plate fracture healed up patient walking about moving about is a better chance for the fracture to heal up now you can see these fractures can this ever heal up this comminuted fracture in a nail you can say you can put in a better nail with the intra with the screw in the neck one two screws here and there but i feel such a comminuted fracture is a very poor chance of healing and here you can see this this is the one if you had put in the nail and a plate this has a much better chance of healing or here you can see proximally the hold of the nail is very poor Initially, also it is not very good. So such fractures have a comparatively lesser chance of healing in these osteoporotic bones. Probably the adjuvant plate may be a better option. I do not want to say that it will not heal up without the adjuvant plate, but the chances of healing and chances of non-union are reduced dramatically if this adjuvant plate is put in. as you can see this long oblique fracture this is unstable in nail everything is bent in two two screws and this is unstable in nail this is an excellent hold over here but this is unstable in nail so it went on to non union pain 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 so ultimately it needed a plate fixation so this is the one on day 1 i will do a adjuvant plate in such sort of a comminuted or a long oblique unstable fracture now this is a fracture this is the orthopedic surgeon's wife 
created upon this piece came out. So the proximal hold has become poor. And this ultimately ended up like this. So this fracture, if it has happened this way on the table, this piece has broken off. Probably it's the one you put in a PFN, put in a hook plate, and then you have a good fixation there. This is a superb stability. And the patient walks about on day one and everything is held up extremely well. Now I come to upper two third and lower one third. This is the one where the hold is very good proximally, but distally the hold is not very good. This needed a supplementary plate for it to heal up. You can see this lower round round, there is no hold. So it is swaying. Once it is swaying like this, you have a lysis which has occurred of the fracture at the bone. While this fracture which has been done, you can see it is not holding properly. And that is the run, you can see here, the nail has no hold on the distal end. This is the CT scan. Proximally, it is a good hold. And that's the reason this is the one which goes into non-union with anti-grade nail. Probably been claimed as anti-grade nail with four screws or a, or a nail from the lower down with four screws distally has a much better chance of healing. Here you can see there is the three screws have been done. Still, this went into non-union, so it needed another operation there. I feel lower femur nail, distal femur nail, is a much better option. As you can see here, I have done the distal femur nail, and then it is moving about, and still there is no instability there. So I went on, and ultimately it healed up. The, the hold over here, subchondral hold of the nail, is the one which is most contributory for the stability of the distal fragment. It is enhanced by two, three, four screws. Nowadays, you can put in four screws into the distal fragment if there is a place. So that's the reason why a DFN nail in a subchondral, which is the biggest and the best fixation for this. Now, this is the type of a nail which is now available, distal femur nail with three, four, five screws and a plate, though it is not available in India. This is the one which will give you probably a much better fixation. But still, the best part of it is subchondral nail is. It is the one which is a subchondral nail where the nail is holding very well. So that's the one which gives you the best chance of healing. This subchondral distal femur nail will work in junctional fractures. But it's not sure. Why not an adjuvant plate when in doubt? Overkill it may be. But that adjuvant plate will probably assure you that patient doesn't go through the second surgery. Now, this was the fracture, comminuted long oblique fracture. I treated on the day one with the um, long anti-grade nail and a plate. And it everything held up. Patient walks about, moves about on day one. Be on the safer side instead of if it doesn't heal, we'll do it. I feel such junctional fractures are better off with this double plating. Now, this is the fracture. The arthroscopy, arthroplasty surgeon operated this. So he went back to the arthroplasty surgeon. He did the nail. Now you can see the nail. Two screws he has put in, but the nail hold is very poor. This ended up into non-union. Ultimately, I treated it with a long plate and a bone graft and everything is healed up. But this Maharani, if it was nailed and plate, it would have healed up very well and it would not have any problem. That's the reason day one, overkill is not a sin. Here it is again a lower one third fracture with the communion here. Again the non-union and that's the reason why it had to be done there. Here is the fracture, though it's not that lower one third, but still it is a poorer hold on the distal fragment, so it needed an adjuvant plate for the fracture to heal up. So this sort of a non-union that patient goes through six months and then gets operated upon in another four or six months. So it's a, such a long journey for an orthopedic patient. I feel it's not a sin to do an overkill on day one into this sort of a junctional fractures. Now I come to lower tibia. 
oblique fracture lower tibia. Nailing is ideal with three screws lower down, as you can see. Probably this nail could have been subchondral, but it's not very easy because you cannot really ream it with the normal ways. This got nail broke down, the plate broke down, the long short oblique fracture, unstable construct. This is another fracture. After nailing, it was unstable, as you can see. This was unstable after even plating the fibula. Still, it was unstable, as you can see very well. And that's the reason why, ultimately, on the table, I decided this, this instability is not acceptable to me. And I put in a plate on the side. And this is the one after five, five months. The fibula plate is there. And this is the one after five months, it is held up. Patient is comfortable walking about, moving about on day one. Or oh, this is another lower one third tibia. Fibula has been fixed up. The tibia was fixed up very well and it was nailed. But in order to be this such an oblique fracture, I didn't want to take any chance. So I put in the plate and this plate which has put in and just you can see it in two months time, the healing process has started and patient is very comfortable. I will not say this fracture will not heal up without a plate. I agree. But this small plate, which is MIPPO, it helps for the fracture healing to the greatest extent. Upper one third tibia, nowadays they are treated with a suprapatellar nail, which probably is a better option. But even if the nailing and the reduction and everything is good, the chances of non-union are higher. This was the non-union which had to be treated with this double plating and a grafting. Or you can see this fracture. Good nailing, good reduction, but still fracture went into non-union. Overkill on day one, if you had done the plating along with it, it would have held up very well. I'm talking about these junctional fractures only. Now here you can see this fracture. Four screws proximally. A long oblique fracture. Five months pain, 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 pain. And this is the other fracture. Lower down, lower one third oblique fracture. Five screws lower down. And this is the one which is a polar screw, which you can see. Till four months pain, 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 pain. On day one, a juvenile plate would have probably solved the problem. Or the same thing is over here. A juvenile plate would have solved the problem. Patient would have been all right. Radiologically, it may take a little longer time to heal up, but it will heal up. Conclusion, overkill on day one. Why not? What is the harm? At least in a doubtful fixation with the doubtful instability, we must do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that wonderful concept of overkill for this junctional fracture. Any any questions from the faculty members? Uh, Sir, may I ask question one? Yes, sir. Please. Bolo, please. Bolo. Uh, sir, ji, uh, do, do you do adjoint plate first, uh, this nail, adjoint plate and then locking? Or you do a nailing, complete the procedure and do a MIPO adjoint plating? I first complete the nailing procedure completely. See for any instability if it is there and then put an adjuvant plate. But after a nailing, whatever the reduction you do it, some uh, translation here and there it remains because of a closed nailing. In a situation before you locking, suppose if you do an adjuvant plate first and then lock, uh, it will give a better stability as well as the better correction of the uh, reduction. I, I agree. But do you feel that minor displacement in a nailing is going to be an issue? No, it does not matter very much. So radiologically, you will improve the situation probably. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. But uh, Dr. Gardegone, then putting the screws of the plate before the nail will cause problem putting the nail. So it is better no, no, to no. put He's in putting the put a nail, put a nail first, and then put in a plate to correct the minor displacement and then lock it distally. Yeah. 
Sir, can I just ask one question? Right. Hello, Ajit. Uh, it's about that uh, one particular example where you showed four or five screws in the distal segment. Um, yes. Generally, the principle is some sort of relative stability has to be there with an intermediary device. So now we are having a conflict of principles here. You are having a relative stability and then the plate is eliminating that relative stability concept. You, so, want, to, you want to make the fracture heal? Or you want to abide by that small principles which has been uh, uh, given uh, at one time? So, because I yeah, think the, 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 the question is stuck and the patient is functionally moving about and walking about on day two, day three. This is all what we are functioning about, me, basically. What you no. agree, what you say, I agree. But in any situation, nail and a plate has almost succeeded, I would say, almost 100% of the time if you've been able to do it. Would you agree to that? No, I agree. No, my question was, sir, how would uh, the operating surgeon decide on table? Because many of us, when we are nailing, we put the patient on a fracture table. So it is difficult to assess those minor movements. That, that's for the decision making, for the benefit of uh, junior surgeons, how to decide. See, I have talked about the junctional fractures only. Yes, sir. And a junctional comminuted fracture proximally, which we do it in a fracture table, I agree. You cannot judge it. But the distal femur, we don't do it on a fracture table. Lower tibias and upper tibias, we don't do it on a fracture table. So there it is comparatively much easier to assess. Okay. In a proximal femur, junctional upper, upper fourth, one fourth and lower three fourths, I feel they are the really dicey fractures once they are comminuted like this. And I, without even proving that they are stable or not stable, I'll go ahead and put in a plate there. This is what I have been speaking about. While in the lower one-thirds, I will see for the stability. If there is a stable fracture, then I may not do it. But as I said, overkill to me is not an issue. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. In spite of busy schedules at uh, Indoor, you join. Uh, and delivered this talk. That, thank you so much. Moving on, uh, we move to the next. Thank lecture. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you, Navin. Thank, thank you, you Navin, for doing everything thank for you. me. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with this, we move on to the lecture from Dr. Vivek Tikha. So, nailing in associated intraarticular fractures. Please share your screen, sir. Thank you so much. We can see the presentation, fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gadegoni, sir. And welcome to this IOA subcommittee of nailing, which has been doing some active, very good teaching purposes work for all over India as well as abroad. This is My your talk... inspiration. This is your inspiration. <laughs> no, sir. It's all your effort and your guidance, which is doing this. And uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar, as well as your other colleagues of Santos and Dr. Chandak, sir. Intramedullary nailing in combined fractures, and I'll be dealing with article, and some of that will be overlapped with the first talk of Dr. Shank Shiv Shankar, sir, and the next talk, which is subsequently to me, like by Dr. Gadegune. But remember that what we are discussing here are the combined articular and sharp fractures, which is highly unusual and a high energy mechanism injuries. Remember that they are usually associated with other associated injuries like polytrauma, other organ injuries or other long bone fractures in at least 60 to 70 percent of cases. Limited treatment guidelines are available out here and we need to see because over the years people have gained their experiences and ensured that it let's say that or they have provided their own guidelines for this. I looked around in the literature and only one of the papers for the proximal femur was there or the femur shaft with intraarticular fractures a retrospective case of nearly 25 cases where they had 10 cases with shaft, neck, as well as distal femur, where they managed with intramedullary screws and nails and screws alone. If you look at the tibia also, tibia is also having very less literature, only one of the literatures which could be found where out of 1,500 cases, only 50 cases of non-contiguous that is, we are not talking of fractures which are intraarticular extending into the shaft, but we are talking of fractures which are separate associated diaphysial 
as well as intra-articular fractures. And they use nail plate constructs in them. So if we start looking at these fractures and how do we diagnose these fractures, the first thing to look at these fractures will be to have a CT scan because CT scan alone can tell us whether there is an intra-articular as well as a diaphyseal area which are separate from mm -hmm. each other. You can see that intra-articular fracture is there and a diaphyseal in both these CTs of the femur as well as tibia. The principles is, as we discussed, an articular fixation is anatomical with absolute stability and diaphyseal fixation is with relative stability. Maintain mechanical axis and alignment is the key thing for us. And it has to be done with the best possible fixation, which we can have for both the fracture patterns. Now let's see some femur cases examples. This is a 40 year old male operated in 2017, where you could see he has a neck femur, shaft femur, and a fracture, which is separate going into the intra-articular distal femur fractures, lateral condyle. You can see the CT scans tells us that there is a segment which is a separate diaphyseal and an intra-articular fracture away from this and a neck femur fracture as well. So since it was having a neck femur fracture, oops, just a minute, there's a lot of noise out here. So Sorry for that. Uh, if you see what we did out here was that we went in for the neck femur fracture, we had to go for an anterior grade nail. So we kept deliberately our fracture as small as length of the nail as slightly short and fixed the distal fracture separately with first with K wires and then subsequently with lag screws. And this is how that neck femur shaft femur and the distal femur were fixed with the best possible fixations for all the three fracture patterns. This is a subsequent where you can see that the fracture has started uniting. Now let's look at another fracture pattern where the shaft is also there and uh, there is a HOFA element for that. So Dr. Shiv Shankar showed wonderful cases which are much more complex than this, but I'll just show some simple cases where you have an sagittal fracture, coronal fracture plane, along with a diaphyseal shaft fracture. So here again, since it is a coronal, you can do it separately. So the coronal fracture was fixed with k wires first, and a regular entry point for the distal femur was made, which ensuring that the reduction is proper, and the k wires were holding the OFAS element for us, which was subsequently replaced with the screws. This so is his six weeks. Shall I interrupt, Vivek? Yeah. The nail has been passed at 180 degree reverse. Actually, the distal femur curvature, the nail has... Yeah, been yeah. I, 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 yeah, 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 I understand. This there, is a very that's common a very mistake common, common mistake do. which is done. And yeah. because of the many a times the pliability of the supracondylar region, usually will have some deformities which will be exaggerated. But if it is pliable, it will not have much of the deformities. And this is done and fixation at six months, it's subsequent four months, which was there. And you can see that the fracture has united, which was separate for the diaphysis as well as separate for the hoofers. Now, again, a fracture having a neck femur, shaft femur, and a separate lateral condyle. Since this lateral condyle fracture was quite long and was going higher, Again, if you can see that this was fracture was going slightly higher for us with the PCL avulsion, which was also there. We again went in with the neck femur anti-grade nailing for that. But here, along with the screws, which we had done previously, we took a plate, a simple plate along with the lag screw, which is there. The neck appears to be slightly in rotation, which is there. And then subsequently, the PCL was fixed from the posterior aspect of that. And if you see three months later, the fractures have united. So it is just giving the optimal and the best amount of stability for individual fractures, which can be combined with the nailing, as well as the intra-articular fractures can be combined for the plating or by screws, depending upon the fracture pattern and the length of the fracture. So if we are talking of the bifocal femoral injuries, 
remember that many a times, which are non-contiguous fractures, which we are talking of, unlike many of the fractures which Dr. Shiv Shankar showed, which were contiguous fractures, reduction of particular fragment may not be dependent on diaphyseal components. We can choose the fixation modalities as per the individual fracture pattern, because that gives us a leeway because it is a non-contiguous fracture pattern. And both, I have shown you examples of anti-grade fracture nailing, as well as retrograde nailing, in addition to screws, vis-a-vis -vis plates, depending upon the intra-articular element which is there. So you get the absolute stability for the articular fracture and the relative stability for the diaphyseal fractures with two separate implants, which are giving you the best possible fixation methodology. Coming to the tibia. Again, tibia nowadays, previously, that was not many of the articular with fractures of the diaphysis were there, but over the present last four or five years, I would say that their incidence has increased and we are having combined and combination injuries in a much more intensity or incidence, if I can say that. So here you have a segmental tibia along with an articular depression. Now, if we want to fix this segmental tibia, we need a diaphysial or a nail, which is the ideal treatment but how to take care of the intra-articular fracture element, which is a non-contiguous fracture again. So as we said, plates or screws for the intra-articular fragment and nailing for the diaphyseal fractures. Let's see this imaging and see how we have done this in a stepwise manner. We looked at the fracture pattern, did, forgot or totally kept aside the diaphyseal segmental fracture isolatedly look for the intra-articular fracture element, lift that fracture up in a standard way like you do for an articular fracture. And once you have taken care with the bone substitute or whichever way you want to fix them or lift up the fragments, KYS were put and then subsequently screws were put. If you see in the lateral view, all the screws are in the center or in the posterior aspect of the thing because the CT scan had told us where that fracture was exactly lying. And after that, you can easily put, if you see the anterior 50% of your axial section, we have a good entry point for our nail, which will be working wonders for our diaphyseal segmental fracture. This you could do with the suprapatellar nail because that gives us a great advantage nowadays. Or even if you don't want to do it with suprapatellar nail, even an infrapatellar will do provided how you manage it in a segmental fracture the way we have been doing over so many years. And then subsequently, the reductions were taken for the diaphyseal fracture fragments and the nailing was done in a standard fashion. So you have done two different incisions, given individualized treatment and adequate respect to individual fractures and given the best optimal stability which can be given for the individual fractures. This is the post-op x-rays, follow-up and you can see that the range of motion if is there because it was done in a totally minimally invasive way and in a possible, the normal standard way by which we do it, the results are quite good. Now let's look, this was the first case where I had done this. It was around five to seven years back. If you see, he had a floating knee with a fracture of the femur shaft, tibial shaft and this intra-articular fracture. So we did and went about doing our nailing for the femur nail, but when we saw and when we had the skin condition for the tibia that was quite swollen and we didn't know what to do exactly at that time, we were thinking how to go about doing this. So we initially put in a fixator to stabilize that and subsequently found that the skin condition deteriorated for much more and we didn't know how to go about doing and our plating options were taken out because of this. So we had to wait for some time. And once we waited with the skin of the diaphyseal part, then we went about planning it again, a non-contiguous fracture pattern, where with the best possible fixations will be plate and nail. And we went about doing it with the nail entry site as a suprapatellar sort of an entry or a slightly, we went about opening the paramedial site. And then we went about fixing it. And as you can see, we put in a plate along with the nail for such case because the soft tissues for the plating of the diaphysis was not good for us. This was at two months. And finally, at six months, you can see that the femur, tibia, everything had united in a proper way, giving the best possible outcome for the patient. Another case, slightly contiguous, if I can say, because the fracture is going, but it is still a small intra-articular fracture. 
you can see in the CT scan, get a CT scan to understand and visualize where that fracture of the intraarticular fragment is so that you need to lift it up and whether it is going to interfere with the entry point of your nail or not. Since similar things which I have shown you before can be done for such a fracture, lifting up the fracture pattern, lifting up the fracture of the articular depression, here we thought that the plate, because it was a split depression along with it and it was slightly combinated for us, we put in a plate first with few screws holding the fracture and putting in our guide wire and the nail for the suprapatellar. As we had seen in the CT scan that the fracture was posterior, the intraarticular fragment, a nail or a suprapatellar nail could easily be put for such a fracture. And the plate, as you see in the lateral, is posterior to the entry point. Screw fixations from the proximal articular area have already been done. Smaller screws were initially put or screws which are going posterior were put so that the nail is not interfering with the plate or the screw fixation. And sub then subsequently, routinely, the diaphyseal fractures have been fixed in a nail plate construct. You can see the way minimally invasively it has been done. Small stabs for the suprapatellar nailing part and the tibia where the plate has been put. This is the post-op x-rays and six weeks follow-up. And you can see with the same fracture pattern that the patient is having good range of motion. So what are the tips and how do we plan it out? First of all, understand the CT scan because that is going to tell you where that articular depression is and whether you can hold it with K wires or you need and can be putting in multiple screws for the same. The articular reduction normally is done first. You hold the articular reduction with K wires vis a vis a plate or a screws. And keeping your entry point for the nail as empty or virgin. Remember that the nail entry is in the first 10% of your axial scan. Rest of the fracture fragments can be fixed with screw. If you have a cross-sectional area of the axial scan of your proximal tibia, 10% of it is going to be the nail entry in the proximal superior part. Once you do this, the nail insertion will not be affecting the articular reduction. And subsequently, understanding the CT, you can fix the plate first with small screws if you require in the distal part. And once your nail has gone, the plate can be subsequently changed with long screws as well. And finally, there are some cases which are contiguous, a polytrauma case where you can see that it is an intraarticular fracture, very high proximal, along with which is going into the diaphyseal with a bad wound with just five to seven centimeters of proximal end, can also be fixed with intraarticular screw fixations. And the K wires have been done, multiple K wires have been put here. And once you have put in the k wires, you have reduced the articular fracture, then you reduce your proximal shaft fracture and a suprapatellar nailing can be done, which gives you the optimal fixation for all the fracture patterns. This is how we had fixed it. He had a bad open wound of the calcania. That's why we had kept the nail short because we were not sure whether he might go into an amputation later or not. You can see that the wounds on the soft tissues on the proximal skin was pretty bad. And hence, after six months, you can see that he's having a, still a problem of the heel, but the fracture fixation has worked and the fixation has united. This is his femur as well as the pelvis. So finally, in the take home, I would say that indications for nailing have increased in the current years, few years. And now we can also have intraarticular fractures which can be incorporated as was shown by Dr. Shiv Shankar and will be shown by Dr. Gadegoni sir also now. Intraarticular with diaphyseal can also be taken care in these fractures. CT evaluation is a must. Understanding the fixation and the fractures. Articular reduction, remember, along with the alignment is the one which you need to take care of both. So make it an individualized treatment so that that is different and the articular congruity is different and axis alignment is different. Both nailings in femur are possible, anti-grade and retrograde along with fixations. Suprapatellar nailing is advantageous in intibia, 
when you are doing these fractures. You can also do it for distal fractures where intraarticular fractures are there with shafts. And the nail blade construct or intramedullary nail with screw augmentation are viable options which can be done for both femur and tibia when we are doing these extreme nailings. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Trikha sir. That was wonderful. Uh, any questions to Dr. Trikha sir? Dr. Trikha, if we know there is a space for the nail insertion in upper and tibia with intraarticular fractures, and we have a space to put the screws uh, in upper and tibia through the plate, then why we uh, don't go first the nail and then plate? So it is just depending upon how your fracture is. When I'm doing, if it is just your fracture fragments of your intraarticular fracture, maybe extending into the place where your nail has to go, then I will provisionally fix it because the positioning of your nailing and the reaming can slightly change my articular congruity. Hence, we provisionally fix it with K wires. If my fractures can be very properly fixed in the posterior part, we have put in all the plate screws out right there and there. But if it is a minor one, we just hold it so that once our major, if I can say, displacements, which can be done in a laying, have been tackled. And then subsequently, we might to make any minor adjustments. We can do that subsequently also. So we provisionally fix them and then subsequently change them to screws. But yes, if the fragments are totally separate, we can do that. As I said, the sagittal ones are the ones where we normally do not fix them initially purely. The coronal fractures, which are Hofa's element or the posterior medial fractures, which are totally separate and have no having any bearing on the nailing entries or the changes, you can do whichever way and whenever you want them, be it previous to nail or post nail. Yeah, I will add to that, Santosh. Uh, see, in uh, when the both the elements are there, when you're doing the nailing, the chances that uh, this intraarticular fragment gets separated and it may not be looking like what you have seen in the CT is very, very high. So it's better to do the fixation of the intraarticular fracture first, then the nailing. And second thing is the nail also comes in the way of taking a proper CM picture. So since the CM gets focused to the metal, the quality of the fracture seen without a nail is entirely different with the presence of a nail. So that is another reason why you can better visualize the fracture without a metal inside. So I would rather fix, like Dr. Rika, intraarticular element first, then I'll go ahead with the nailing. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and you, sir. After this, we have uh, <clears throat> Dr. Gadegoni's lecture, uh, his favorite talk on suprapatellar nailing. So let us learn the nuances of suprapatellar nailing from Dr. Gadegoni. <clears throat> go ahead, sir. Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. So it is nothing but the uh, um, stretching of the Vivek Trikas lecture, and uh, we can name it as stretching the limits of suprapatellar nailing, uh, because the now a suprapatellar nailing is a well accepted method in a complex uh, PBL fractures. Now, literature is also supporting and there is no issue about this thing. So, I will go that the characteristic of extremity, extreme tibial fracture is a junctional zone, positive of the soft tissue and presented with the soft tissue injury of an intraarticular fractures. Complications and prognosis directly related to the degree of soft tissue injury, hence bypass the precarious zone by nail and instead of doing a plating open reduction and fixation, always it is better to do by nail. So there are issues, nailing in a metaphyseal fractures, deforming forces, entry point and placement of the nail. Differences between proximal and distal tibia fracture is a quadriceps is the deforming forces, whereas the fibula is the deforming force. And therefore, we have to take in all account when we do a suprapatellar nailing. And there is also a difference in the proximal and distal tibial fracture. 
center center position of nail is important in a distal tibial fracture whereas entry point is crucial in the proximal fracture so having this uh, learned uh, basics things how the suprapatellar nailing can be executed to so nailing in a dextral uh, extreme tibial fractures to overcome deformity of proximal and distal tibia fractures what is the solution and solution is the suprapatellar nailing in a semi extended position with adjoint clamps polar screws to reduce and stabilize the fractures so current indications of nailing certain intra articular and extra articular tbl fractures within 50 mm in proximal and 30 mm of the distal plafond so so such a extreme tbl fractures can also be managed with the help of the suprapatellar technique now this is a famous semi extended position multi lock nail to be used and bolstered under the knee to maintain 15 to 20 degree of flexions so this is one of the example a compound fracture extreme proximal tibial fracture clamp assisted reduction you can see here this is a, a very oblique fracture going into the tibial condyle probably you may need a such a patient a ct scan now clamp assisted close reduction suprapatellar approach and you can see how beautifully there is a restoration and apex neutralization by a polar screw one year follow up the full function and you can see that the patient is able to do all activities here now this is a 45 year polytrauma patient compound 3a fracture of the femur segmental tibia fracture clavicle fracture lower end radius fracture i will mostly concentrate on extremity fracture here and you can see damage control debridement of the wound calcaline p9 immobilization in thomas splint for few days and then after 7 days the patient was taken for surgery a suprapatellar approach close tibial fixation on a simple table final close fixation of a segmental fracture minimal invasive surgery and after having done a tibial fracture stabilization multi lock suprapatellar nailing for femur trans tendinous approach multi lock suprapatellar nailing mini invasive surgery so such a floating injury a complex floating injury can be managed with a suprapatellar nail and a suprapatellar nail a through a trans tendinous approach and suprapatellar approach this is the example you can see fixation of segmental fracture suprapatellar nailing femur and tibia close technique post operative two months follow up and four months follow up fracture is completely united of the tibia sometime it has taken for the femur and required a bone grafting procedure another example is 60 year male Okay, this is the segmental fracture with a soft tissue issue. Calcaneal pin was given for some time. Traction and fracture alignment, clamp reduction of the proximal fragment, and insertion of posterior polar wire or pin, suprapatellar orthotomy, sleeve passage, appropriate entry and guide wire passage, concentration first on the proximal fragment and then on a distal fragment. while passing the guide wire reaming because to take a very special precaution while doing a reaming in a segmental fracture as given by the tips given by the ajit passage of the nail final locking and you can see this is the post op x ray mini invasive surgery by suprapatellar approach alignment of the proximal as well as the distal fragment and you can see after 6 month follow up full function and a complete range of movement another example presented after 10 days from other hospital blisters they are all get to heal patient was restless for surgery difficult to do a plating a segmental fracture what to do and suprapatellar approach clamp assisted reduction 
bypass surgery and uh, you can see stages passing a guide wire, then nail, multiple locking proximal and distal, final placement of the nail. There is a, some translation of the comminuted pieces, but with the proper fixing of both proximal and distal fragment, everything held along nail, nine month follow up patient is able to do all his activities. Another example, a very, you can see, this is a very dangerous injury, soft tissue issues, compound fracture at the ankle also, and the, the gluing of the skin, extensive soft tissue in and the patient was a control hypertensive but a chronic tobacco chewer. And you can see here, I have done a clamp assisted bypass surgery, guide wire introduction, clamp assisted reduction, and you can see there is not only a segmental fracture for one of the distal segment was a comminuted also and there was a very large butterfly fragment. It is a very difficult to pass a nail through the butterfly fragment. It requires a trick and stabilization of the, that fragment and your guide wire must go through the canal of that butterfly fragment. It is a, such a large fragment. So, reaming, and you can see here, we have to stabilize the middle fragment. Otherwise, if there is a problem always, spinning of the middle segment is possible. Therefore, we have to take this precaution, distal and proximal locking, mini invasive surgery, bypass surgery, and you can see very small incisions. All soft tissues are bypassed. They are there as it is. And you can see after three months of follow, everything wound has healed, union is progressing, good range of motion, and patient is able to walk with support and probably a subsequently the fracture will unite. Another fracture with intra-articular extension, and you can see such a complex comminuted fracture extended into the joint, clamp-assisted reduction and plate augmentation, mini invasive surgery, and you can see here, within three months of follow-up, fracture is uniting, patient is able to do all his activity because of his stable fixation. Another example, the portiporeal male compound comminuted fracture extended to the joint was treated in other hospital with a debridement of wound and expect such a complex fracture extending into the intraarticular area, multiple pieces and tumor and tibia, you can see it's a swollen pouring pus. After two months, this huge comminuted fracture, doubtful viability of all fragments, no improvement in wound condition, and there was a showcase, protruding bone and pin tract infection. So parameters of infection, there were C-react protein, CS, ESR, they were borderline except less than 8 gram of hemoglobin. Removal of express, debridement of intervalent wound, skin cover and cast till holes healed, and the anticlepsilla, uh, the an antibiotics were given. And then ultimately, I converted into a locking plate expix was applied, thinking that bypassing the communicated zone and you could also solve the problem of a, a soft tissue tethered uh, soft tissue to the bone. And ultimately, the patient was very comfortable with this and subsequent follow up, but no progress in the healing, maybe because of the devitalized tissues. But the patient was very happy and no consolidation over the period of four months. And he was walking with crutches and no pain, nothing, nothing. But I was worried as well as the patient, there was no consolidation of the fracture. So ultimately, hence removal of the fixator. Functional varies for one month, distracting to regain some length on the table, and ultimately a close nailing by creating a path to the sleeve of suprapatellar nail by 8 mm rigid pointed rimmer first, and then by flexible rimmer. Close procedure, sufficient stages of suprapatellar nailing, and you can see this is the post operative limb. There is no scar. Everything is bypassed uh, through this uh, tunnel, 
and the suprapatellar nailing was done. It was a reaming also done, but that reaming product will help in the union of the fractures. Bone marrow installation at the fracture site was done. Subsequently, on the table, and you can see here, a closed locking post-operative X-ray, complete wood healing, and subsequent follow-up. One centimeter, there is a shortening, and this is the yesterday's follow-up. Six-month follow-up, fracture is unouting, he has resumed the duties. Probably today, it looks a very difficult, um, very uh, different picture, but after remodeling and consolidation after one year, you will find that the whole TBI is formed. Another example, extreme fracture, proximal and distal TBL fracture, long segment, very less than five centimeter of the proximal fragment, treated by suprapatellar approach with polar screw. Then ultimately there was a distraction, dynamization was done, union and full function. Another example, impending butterfly fragment is a difficult to treat by nailing because that intraarty, that butterfly fragment, it becomes a complete while doing a nailing by infrapatellar approach. Stabilization of the butterfly fragment becomes a very difficult. So clamp assisted reduction, passing the guide wire through that butterfly fragment a canal, perfect anatomical restoration, and one year follow up full function. Another example, a suprapatellar approach, small wound, infrapatellar region, difficult to treat, grass swelling, proximal tibial fracture, just passing a nail. And you can see here, the one year follow up, everything healed around the nail. Another example, a distal tibial fracture, semi-extended position, calcaneal fear for better manipulation of the distal fragment, Clamp assisted reduction, use of a polar screw to centralize the guide wire and reamer with the help of controlled traction with temporary pin in subcondral bone or in calcaneum, fixation of fibula by nail or plate, and you can see insertion of guide wire in the medullary canal in the center at the subcondral bone and difficulty in centralization of the nail. We have to take the precaution. In an extreme distal TBL fracture, you have to pass a calcaneal field for good axial traction and indications for blocking screws. This is how we can use in difficulty of centralization, use the blocking screws so that you can centralize the nail and it also will yield into the stability. Such an example, very comminuted fracture with a soft tissue issue. Even after 15 days, there was no healing, restless patient, restless doctor, what to do? And ultimately, clamp assisted reduction, central position of the head wire in both AP and lateral, use of a polar screw, proximal and distal locking, and you can see the fracture is completely healed. Stable fixation lead to healing of mechanically incompetent but biological viable fragment to heal in a comminuted fracture. So just alignment and distal and proximal locking use stable fixation, everything heals. Another example, extreme distal tibial fracture with a stage wound presented after 18 hours. So instead of waiting for a very long time, calcalian pin, a debridement, there was a much more defect. The play, the, this uh, fibular nailing was done. You can see here how fibular nailing was done, close method, and reaming also is done. And ultimately, fibular nailing, first guide wire into the tibia, fibular nailing, then passing the nail, and small apex neutralization by a small locking plate nearly an augmentation plate, you can see a complete restoration of the anatomy, everything healed and patient is under observation. Another extreme distal tibial fracture with a segmental fracture of the fibula, and this is the soft tissue. After waiting, bypassing the tunnel surgery, and there is a polar pin to glide, 
then centralization and centralization of the nail and you can see here number and position of the distal locking screw is determined by the facts of morphology in proximal and distal fracture insert the greatest number of the screw for distal tibial fracture at least three screw and may require one polar screw and for proximal four screw and you may require one polar screw and you can see here bypassing the tunnel very extreme distal tibial fracture fracture healed nicely with the fibular fracture also healed segmental fracture suprapatellar approach ease of performing surgery minimal invasive surgery it reduces the bile alignment suprapatellar approach protection sleeve and pick crocar helps to protect the soft tissue shorter operative time improved post operative function despite previous concern this technique has not been associated either a cartilage injury or increased post operative pain so propeller intramedullary nail technique lowers the rate of malunion in both proximal and distal tibial fracture and it is one of the now a very favored method in the segmental tibial fracture no need to change the position of the leaf after the reduction of the fracture suprapatellar nail is a friend in need is a friend indeed in a very difficult situation of the fracture management so thank you very much thank you dr gadegune and i am really mesmerized by the fantastic uh, <coughs> reduction perfect nailing procedures for all these difficult uh, fractures of um, tibia Uh, wonderful display of uh, your technique any questions to garden dr gadegun i think all are mesmerized <laughs> to talk on this distinct finger nailing and with this uh, we can move on to uh, the next lecture by dr gaur sir gaur sir can be quite you for sharing your screen and please proceed with your Dr. Gardegon has to unshare. I think it is not sharing. <clears throat> oh, you can uh, share your screen. No problem. It is already unshared. Uh, on the bottom of screen, you will be having a share. Screen. Yeah, I press that. It is showing. Chrome tab. Choose what to share. Not able to share. Doctor Gadegoni has already unshared. We are, therefore we are okay. seeing. I will just. I'll just. Just, just take your own time, sir. No problem. Yeah. In case you find difficulty, we can take Doctor Navin Thakkar's lecture and then you can take. No, I, I think just wait for a second. Okay. 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 Can you see it? No, not yet. It has come to my screen. Doctor Navin, any suggestions for Doctor? Uh, Gaur sir, yes, just yes, uh, he has to share the screen in the middle lower, and then select the whole desktop, not the only PowerPoint. Gaur sir, yeah, I'm on the. आपको जहाँ हम लोगों का फोटो दिखता है ना हम लोगों का वीडियो दिखता है वो सिलेक्ट करो स्क्रीन. Yeah, okay. Then you will be able to share completely. आपका फोटो सेंटर में दिख रहा है नाउ आई शेयर द स्क्रीन या इट इज सेइंग चूज व्हाट टू शेयर या चूज व्हाट टू शेयर देयर यू सिलेक्ट द होल डेस्कटॉप एंटायर स्क्रीन एंटायर स्क्रीन यस ओके देन वंस यू सिलेक्ट द एंटायर स्क्रीन यू सिलेक्ट योर पावर पॉइंट एंटायर स्क्रीन यू आर सीइंग बट Okay. Choose the PowerPoint. Where is your PowerPoint, sir? PowerPoint sir, is in is on the desktop. So first you open the desktop, your PowerPoint. First you open the PowerPoint on the desktop and then share the screen. Okay. That way also you can do. Same way you. Uh, I have opened my presentation. Yes. 
and then now now yeah. now you have a green button lower down in the middle or the, it may be in the upper your share screen then i have to go to the share screen you window. have to go to the zoom you have to go back to the zoom meeting where the zoom meeting is okay and you can either click on the presentation or the whole screen okay on your phone if you can share the uh, video of your screen sir that also we can guide you yeah what you are seeing on your screen sir uh, i'm seeing choose what to share so yes I've, I've then then an entire then, then, you, then you click on one of then them you choose, uh, then you choose then you choose the uh, desktop or a whole screen and then click and on then share. then the right right lower side there is a small button of the share again you have to click that share okay not doing anything okay by the time you can do one thing dr tucker you can share your screen you can start your presentation okay by the time i think uh, we'll sort out you okay. can share your screen sir yeah no problem okay i'm sharing i'm sharing yeah, yeah. Dr. Tucker is going to speak on invisible instability. Is it a cause of failure for fixation? So that is his favorite topic as well. Invisible instability. Now you are able to see by my screen? Yes, we are able to see your screen. Like as well as your wonderful photo. I just I am adjusting everything. Okay. So now you are able to see that. Yes. Please go ahead. Let me click the next slide. Yeah. yeah. So it is about the invisible instability uh, in the proximal femur fracture. Why, how, and when? And it is a biomechanical insight, a thought process. So we will be just thinking about these thought processes. These thought process started when we started experimenting in 2001. And we applied for the patent. And you can see here that we st started doing the augmentation uh, through the, the triflange pins where the holes were made. And the augmentation was done with the cement here. And that initial cases, we did it like this. We thought that there is a rotational stability problem only. But that is that was not the case. It is a complete uh, instability. This is the disclosure agreement with Synthes for uh, injecting the cement in the triflange pin, the idea. But after this, what we found that there is a subset of the unstable extra capsular fracture, where along with the medial instability, there is also a lateral wall instability here, if you see. And that stability, uh, instability leads to the many problems. And that can be think of by the literature that there is a cutout 3 to 27 person, there is a medial migration, there is a lateral migration. So this is something instability even after the fixation that has to be thought. We feel that we are fixed very well, but still it is unstable, which we are not able to decide for a particular case. The stability instability level is different. So let us start with the first case. You can see here, surgeon has done a good job. Dr. Santos, are you there? Santos, sir, uh, yes, sir, I am here. Uh, here, the surgeon has done the fixation with the nail. Good reduction, 130 degree, right implant choice, perfect placement. And you can see the anteromedial. There is a positive reduction here. You can check here. That there is a very good positive reduction here. But still, what will happen? It. What do you think? Dr. Santosh Singh. Yes, sir. You have, uh, operated the, you have operated this case. As Let us see what is happening in the uh, follow-up. At the eight weeks, the patient came with this mild virus, nothing to support laterally, toggling, and the medial migration. It is not a collapse. It is a medial migration of the implant into the hip joint. This, and the, there was a lateral tension band breach here. 
if you can see very well, and that has been revised. Again, another case, similar type, and it was fixed and it has gone into the virus on a cyclic loading, and that has again a medial migration in, into the hip joint. And it has gone into the negative reduction. Now, after in the follow-up, right? So there is an instability even after the fixation. That is the problem. The best surgeon, best implant, best reduction, best placement, still there is a failure. That is the problem area. It is a very low subset of the patient. So what are the issues? It is the invisible instability even after the fixation. And the concept of the lateral tension band and unwanted collapse pattern, the migration of the neck elements are happening. Why this is happening? That is the question mark. So we try to study this biomechanics with the Bergman. He has a lab where he can put a different uh, these conditions where sitting in the bed even was creating a very high force in FY, F, FX, F, FZ axis and resultant F force. So the, there is a continuous force is going on. The maintenance of the antiversion, if the antiversion is not maintained, also he thought that there is a loading pattern change in the proximal femur. And here, we were interested here in the junctional area where there is a shear force, varus force at the junction of the nail and the screw at the fracture level. That interface was the most important part for us to study. And we studied that there is also a vector and it is a moving on the flexion and extension of the hip. If you see, it is moving. The whole head rotates, spins on a flexion and extension rotation, or a flexion and extension of the hip joint. So there was a large dynamic and cyclic load even after the fixation from the different directions. And it behaves very differently in different postures of the patient and du during daily routine activities. So when it will collapse, when it will fail, Many times it creates a problem in our uh, practice. So it is a dynamic problem. And that cannot be seen on the static films, on the CM static films or uh, uh, our routine films. So what is a lateral tension band? It is a very dynamic concept. Let, let us try to understand. It is not only this is the lateral wall, but the trochanter and the abductor all combines into a lateral force. There is a lateral force, lateral tension band. If you see this case, here lateral tension band was broken. If you see, lateral tension band was broken and it was a thin wall here and the DHS done and that has given a further damage and lateral tension band has broken. But surgeon was happy on the day 40 Santosh Singh, it has medialized very well and it has gone the stability, bone to bone, good contact with the collapse. Maximum collapse has happened. You can see here. And the surgeon was happy. Are you happy, sir, Santosh Ji? Sir, initially it was good. At day 40, sir, what do you if, think? If you want to manage this situation at this stage, what could have been done? No, we don't know. Santoshi, sir, aap kya what, what will you feel at this condition? At the day 40, your patient is there and uh, you are operated and you are thinking that uh, there is a good valgus. You can see it's a very good valgus. Yes, yes. yes. It is a good medialization. Yes. The nature has done the some job. As a surgeon, surgeon was feeling well. What do you feel as a surgeon? So I think I would add a medial um, uh, TSP. Right, right. Uh, but what, Santosh, what Dr. Santosh Singh is telling, at this stage, are, are you not happy because the, already the God has given the stability by medialization? Yes. So let's right. see what but happens. Let us see. The example here is why? Because still the forces are acting even after the fixation. You can see this. At day 70, it has failed. Because there was no lateral tension and the maximum collapse has happened. Now it, it, it has become almost the fixed angle implant. Now it is stuck in that position. And that has given a problem. So what we require, 
is a lateral tension band for preventing the varus and medialization. So you require something on the lateral side. If there is a lateral side is also gone, there is an instability. Otherwise, this will happen like this, medialization and nothing to support laterally. So you need something to support on the lateral side and that is, that is the way you can control the all instability here. You can see here what is happening. Once you fix it with the TSP, with the DHS, and you can see that there is a good active dynamic valgus force, which prevents further uh, varus of the proximal fragment and the medialization. But what happens in the nail? What happens in the lateral tension band? When lateral wall is already intact, whatever drill hole we make that is coaxial with the this barrel in the nail, the hole in the nail, 130 degree, this is also coaxial. But once this lateral wall is broken, whatever screw you are putting, they are not coaxial. And what happens exactly here, that starts toggling and once it starts toggling you get a instability and you get a z effect or a reverse z effect santoshi you have Hello. you have seen this in your two elements of the neck pfn classical z right. effect and reverse z effect right sir yes sir right but we are not we were not knowing why it is happening but what we studied that why it is happening it was happening in the single implant assembly also if you see toggling is happening here also but here because of the good hold in the head and neck part it was going medially so on the toggling it goes in so either there is a lateral migration or a medial migration there is nothing like z or reverse z effect in the two elements it's our visual impression that it is a Z or reverse Z effect. In a single element, it goes in unidirection. Either it goes in or either it is goes out. But what we observed that the part which has a good fixation here in the head and neck part goes in. It goes in always. The part which is not holding in the head and neck part comes out. That, is, that was the observation here. So now let us see another case, Santoshi. What will you do in this case? Sir, actually, my it is an unstable type of fracture. I think yes. better to be yes. go for the intramedullary nilia. Intramedullary. Okay. The surgeon has done the same job. Can you predict what will happen? See, you can see the reduction is good. Here it is a positive reduction. Here it is also good intramedial contact. Still, it will not, it will fail. It will fail. You are right, it will fail. But uh, I, I am asking Dr. Santosh Singh what, what will happen, how it will fail, what will be the mode of failure, where, where, whether it is a cutout, virus cutout, Z effect or reverse Z effect. So, Z effect. It will be a Z effect. So, yeah. you will feel, you feel that the lower screw will come out and the upper screw will go in, or lower screw, upper screw will come out and uh, lower screw will go in. Upper screw mm -hmm. will come out and inner will go in. Let us see what is happening. It is an M or W effect now. You can see it is an M or a W effect. This is the effect. Both have come out. So there is nothing like a Z or reverse Z effect. It is an instability even after the fixation. This is the invisible instability which we are not able to judge on the table and many times in the initial follow-up also. And this gives us a surprise by giving the, this such a failure by lateral migration of the both the elements. But this does not happen in every case. This does not happen in every case. That is no. why... So how, to is, detect? how to detect on table? How to detect on table? That was the question asked by Dr. Ajit I, sir, I think. Yeah. So, in a fracture table, what you have to do is you have to just release the uh, foot uh, pad on from the fracture table and try to rotate and see in the dynamic film. There will be some jog of movement. There, 
you have to augment and that is the key to understand the instability in such case there are multiple variables because probably the tad was not also good if you see the yes, previous virus virus was there and three of these not good that's why tad was not good both quality may not be good entry of multiple factors yeah. multiple factors which were leading to instability and the forces were acting in such direction virus was not a problem here it was a positive reduction you can see you cannot we cannot say it was a virus because it was a positive reduction here the next half angle is right the screws are going exactly in the parallel if it is in the virus it will go in the upper quadrant moderator sir moderator sir may i interrupt yeah, yeah, yes yes sir please. sir i have actually this is a famous lecture of yours yes i have no doubt about your uh, study and everything and it is in practice we are doing whatever the uh, you give the instructions but when you treat the, the fracture is when treated by osteopath and there is so much instability still the fracture united non union is virtually unknown in a osteopathic treatment in a trochanteric fracture whereas so there is the fracture is unstable fracture is in virus fracture is in external rotation still it throws a very beautiful callus you are right sir you are right so we are restricting the callus also and we are not putting in that position that's why it gets small united <laughs> with the bone setter but it gets united you are right but why but why if the unstable fracture pattern is there and when you do a minimal invasive surgery also it does not throw any callus and union also why because because there are a lot of movements here toggling and there is a restricted uh, things are there the muscle forces are acting but muscle forces are not allowed fully in a untreated case many many times the muscle forces take the care without any implant that may be the probable uh, answer i think dr navin i think uh, the surgeon um, didn't uh, do a perfect uh, nailing yes i said you that this is the operated case you said that probably yes you are right absolutely right but there is a instability even after fixation we feel that there, there is a it, uh, we have made stable many times but it is unstable will go further where so surgeon is not where the surgeon is not doing any fault still you can see what is happening there so at this point so what, dr Ch what, dr chandak's question is pertinent how we know Yes, uh, let me uh, we'll go to the next case then we'll uh, discuss that part okay so why it is happening why there is a toggling so we try to study it and the scientists have also studied the biomechanics of the snake movement it toggles with the friction on the ground it has no legs but still it toggles on the toggling it can move forward you must have heard the story of k wire migrating even into the heart how the k wire along migrates because there is a continuous toggling with the muscle movement and that advances further and further and further that is a rotating effect so this was the problem of rotating and toggling and that was the instability indirectly let us see what is happening now what do you say in this case surgeon has done a halifax nail chandak sir yeah what do you feel surgeon has done a right job here you can see it's a positive reduction reduction is very much positive here if you see it is a positive reduction here right there is no problem here anteromedial also good contact in the lateral view you can see that Yes. Entry is through one. the fracture site. Entry is not right, so it's likely entry to be a problem. Entry is not right. Okay. So many times our entry remains from the fracture site. So it's a very osteoporotic uh, fracture, right? Now yes. let us see what is happening in the follow-up. This is the follow-up. Positive reduction at the eight weeks. What do you think now? Though the entry is from here, it is all comminuted here. There is a great bowing of the 
Tumor in the old age. Yes. There is a positive reduction here and there is a good enteromedial contact. What we understand that once we get a good positive reduction and bone to bone contact, what do you think? What will happen? Santosh Singh, Ajit sir. I actually think uh, I actually think the nail is bored the wrong way around. Uh, looking at this, so <laughs> there must be some technical problem there. Uh, you see the bowing. Normally, you get a anterolateral bowing. Here, uh, it seems it is anterolateral only, sir. No, no. You see the shape of the nail. It's going towards the lateral cortex here. Yes, it goes the lateral cortex only because of the too much of the anterior curvature. It, it is touching the anterolateral part. You're right, absolutely. I think wrong side nail is put on. Yeah, I think that's what has been on the right side. Right. Yeah. Wrong side nail has put. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that may cannot, not be you the cannot, reason for you the failure. Cannot, you cannot fix the 130 degree Halifax uh, with the wrong side. Why? How can you put? If you in, a sort, in, a, in a sort nail, that there is nothing like right and left, sir. Yeah, yeah, correct. It is a universal nail. It's it right is a universal nail. There is nothing yeah. like right or left here. But this nail looks bored. Anyway. Yeah. So you are looking something odd at the nail, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But what do you feel? It is a right and left is same, Halifax nail. Yes. And it is a good prong here. If you see, it is a good pr prong and it is a good fitting here. And this is at the eight weeks. So otherwise, this looks okay, except for your lecture on instability. <laughs> <laughs> because of the Boeing, because of the Boeing, it may still go cut the superiorly going into virus, but at, but everything looks fine for me. Means uh, I I'm okay with this reduction and this position of the screw. Everything. Right. Anybody yes. has any objection? Except the Boeing, which you don't and I don't have control. Okay, <laughs> don't have any control. Surgeon has no control on the anatomy, right? So now, okay. now, 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 this is the case from the literature where you can see that. What has happened? The concept is on the toggling, the neck element has not gone in in a linear fashion. It has gone like serpentile and it has created a big bogda here. Big bogda here. You can see it's a big bogda. So the toggling happens and the movement of the neck element was happening like this. And it has gone even into the pelvis after the head. So these forces are acting continuously and you can see here that it has gone inside the uh, pelvis itself. So what the biomechanically, what is the possibility? This is the case. Uh, of the biomechanical analysis of this case. In this what? case, uh, Dr. Navin, if the yeah. fixation would have been with DHS, would that not have been more better for this patient? Would have avoided all the problems? But anyway, instability was there. Uh, even after the fixation of the best implant with the Halifax and a good uh, TAD, everything, good reduction, positive reduction, everything was good, sir. But still there was a problem because there was an instability remaining which could not be detected on table. Now, what the concept is from the SNEC biomechanics? Scientists have studied this, the biomechanics of the SNEC. If you see, there is a movement of this on the toggling, right? If you remove the toggling, what is happening? How to remove the toggling uh, uh, in the movements of the SNEC? They found that if we put a very smooth plastic material wrap around the snack, it toggles, but it doesn't move. You can see here in this video that it will rewind now. It toggles, but it is not able to move further. It toggles at that place only, but it doesn't uh, move. Right? So same concept to re reduce the toggling. And you can get the stability and movement of the neck elements. Unwanted collapse pattern can be prevented. That was the possibility biomechanically. As you can see here, toggling. Because the ratcheting effect will go away. There won't be any ratcheting on the surface and traveling of the neck element. So this is just a thought 
process. Recording is stopped. <laughs> Good okay. Good this is an unexpected collapse pattern, which is uh, uh, in the literature. And we do further large screw drilling here. If you see, we are drilling here a lot. And we are making it more and more weak. And that's why there is a problem. And the jig, our jig has also a problem. If you want to target exactly the center of the head and neck, we have to rotate it externally. And rotation of this external rotation, many times we have a breach here posterolaterally. And we have a very small incision, we don't feel it. And we make this posterolateral wall more weak by drilling here in the posterolateral part because we want to adjust exactly in the center of the head and neck. And the same way on the rotation, when there is a bowing in anterolaterally here, the stress riser effect is created in the shaft. Pointing effect is created. So we must have a jig, which has a two plane, where this goes exactly in the center of the head and neck with the antiversion, and the shaft should go exactly 90 degree, like this. It goes exactly in the center, maintaining the antiversion. And maintaining the antiversion has also a very good uh, biomechanical uh, advantage. You can see this is the pre op. This is the nail. This is the post op. How beautifully the antiversion is maintained on the both sides. And that gives the equal distribution of the force. And that becomes the destructive force, becomes the constructive force. So we are unable to preserve the lateral tension band when it is broken already. We have all the literature here. The proximal lateral wall thickness is a problem. All studies are there. And this is the benchmark study for the DHS, intra-operative breach of the lateral wall and the post-operative breach of the lateral wall after DHS, even post-operative. Later on in the follow-up, there is a breach in and 32% problem has been reported with this benchmark paper. And the Godfrey started with this plate where there was an additional here to support the lateral wall and he reduced the size of the screw and he put a barrel inside so that the gliding becomes smooth. Another paper with the lateral wall thickness, DHS alone should not be done. So these are the papers. So we have to protect and re-establish the lateral tension band by adding the cooperating the one, one more implant in a such an unstable condition. Here's the one example here, schematic, where the nail and plate combination works in a cooperation. Another case, again, you can see the there is nothing to support laterally and screw goes through the nail, through the plate. And here also the screw goes through the plate, through the nail. And that gives the complete fixation and the greater rocator is wired. So the complete lateral tension band is taken care of. The force on the lateral side is taken care of. And that gives the complete stability. Another example, I will not go into detail. This is a long video of the live surgery. Not going further. Okay. Another case, DHS and that lateral wall is broken with the DHS and the medialization and the problem. Again, this method has been used. And you can see here beautifully that there is a negative reduction. You can see there is nothing to support here on the medial side. If you, you can see that there is a negative reduction. Right? But this screw is touching the Kelkar. So, valgus has been kept what the next half angle is because this goes parallel to the Kelkar. And there is no intromedial contact. But once you give the stability, adequate stability, and then the bone starts uniting. And this bone got united very well. And this is the follow-up. And it is remodeled also at the two and a half years. And you can see how beautifully the medial wall is uh, reconstructed by the nature itself. One should take care of the stability. So the stability, stability and stability is the issue, whatever implant you use. So do we need a union only? Or what about the function? We were happy previously with the medialization. We were thinking the medialization is good. Then we thought the medialization is bad. Then we thought the medialization is very ugly. 
So we don't want this. Now patients don't want because patients are uh, suing our orthopedic surgeons for just a simple lurch. Criminal negligence cases are put. But the literature is confusing about the uh, variety of the unstable fracture. There is a mixed bag of the instability. We have to think for such. And this is the video from Dr. Tanna sir. Where you can see on the rotation or a flexion and extension, you can see the fragment is moving. So you have to check intraoperatively whether stability is there or not. And you feel whatever doubt. This is again a case of Tanna sir where on table he thought that I have to add this. So he added the periprosthetic hook plate exactly putting on the trochanter completely and just made a wire and a unicortical screw here. But still it has given a good stability. So you have to be prepared on table. So when in doubt, Heal instability even after the primary implant insertion, be prepared or anticipate for augmentation, whatever implant system you are choosing. So the message is detect and the preserve, be aware of the lateral tension band concept and the pro protect the lateral tension band when it is already broken and always try to bring back the abductors. Think of the dynamic stability and restoration of the complete lateral tension bend. Because the piece of this trochanter, which is a soft tissue attachment, also brings the vascularity there to add uh, to the healing of the bone. Again, I have a small appeal to all the members of the Indian Orthopedic Association, update your data. And now we have started the verifying the other of the each and every member. So you can go on the website and log in and you put your other number and confirm your other details. So you will become the other verified. We'll shortly we'll put the video and the PDF file how to do it, but it's very easy. And those who are listening, not IO member, as a duty of my, uh, as a secretary, please join us in the IOA. And again, we invite you at Lucknow for IOCON 2023. And in the CME, we invite, because the theme is, again, the innovation, technique, paper, or a case, or idea, which may change my practice, may change your practice. So please contribute your ideas, new things, which may change my colleague's practice, may help my colleague to change their practice, and ultimately it gets the advantage to the patients and the, as a whole society, as an Indian Orthopedic Association contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Navin, for Thank that you, wonderful uh, concept of bringing in instability uh, for failures of intertrochantic fractures. That was wonderful video demonstration of the instability and the serpentine effect leading to leading to further uh, uh, extrusion of nails, Z effect, Z effect, M effect and W effect. Uh, but it was streaming live. So yeah, it was streaming live. Sir, Gaur sir, ready? Gaur sir, ka ho gaya? Dr. Gaur has a question. Ready ho gaya? I will, I'll share and see. I, I have a question to Dr. Naveen. Yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think this plate, the, the plate he has devised, the hook plate, they give stability to bone. Yes. And bony stability is more important than soft tissue uh, stability, what he's talking about, dynamic. See, when you move the hip to lateral side or abduct it, the soft tissue relaxes. So stability goes. When you adduct it, it gives more stability. So it is not actually the gluteus medius or the dynamic which is working, it is the screw which is fixing into the head, like DHS or PFN. Now, when you do the PFN, if your screw is very tight, you know it is not going to do Z effect or M effect. If the screws are not very tight, and as rightly Raveen has said, there is inherent stability is remaining, then there will be movement and the movement any, any nail or anything will loosen up. So it is the screw which is going through the plate into the head 
actually gives more stability, which makes the fracture to unite. What Naveen has to say? Yes, yes. Whatever instability was remaining, that was augmented with the plate. And I have a reverse question to you, Gore, sir. Yeah. You said that the soft tissue or trochanter or abductor has no role. What do you think about the dislocation? Little, little role, little role. Uh, dislocation of the hip when the abductors are not taken care of. The biomechanics is such that there is a varus force continuously happening that is going to reduce your neck half angle. And there is a lateral force which keeps your neck half angle. So lateral valgus force has to be re-established completely lateral tension bend with the bone and the muscle, everything, sir. Thank you. Dr. Naveen, which plate you prefer for the fixation majority? Sir, still uh, we have not made it co commercially. We are doing for us only because still we have our uh, remaining part of uh, research and the biomechanical study. We want to get the rotational stability between the neck element and the nail hole. Yeah. And that is very tricky. So there we are stuck. Till that we get a solution of that on uh, our prototype, we are not going to manufacture, get manufactured it. So, so sir, every, every time you try to fix one screw through the plate and whole uh, plate and nail both or in a different... So, so, so sir, the, 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 the plate design is such that it, it, it cooperates with the, this nail design only. This nail design is such that the holes in the plates are also such that it goes through the plate through the nail hole. And okay. also the proximal locking, uh, transverse locking also goes through the plate, transverse locking that is lateral to medial also goes through the plate, through the nail hole, through the jig. Okay. okay. Santoji, don't worry. Lucknow me sab batayenge aapko. Can you see my screen? Most welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. And now one minute, one minute. Chandak, I have a question for Naveen. Naveen, yeah. you Can said you that instability screen? is the main reason why we are getting all the problem. This instability, can we reduce it by using a neck screw which has got a head? Because you can compress it totally on table. There is a head which acts as a counter support. It can compress to your satisfaction. Whatever the complication you have shown, the screw migrating into the pelvis, they are all headless screws. Those screws cannot be compressed. At the, it means uh, though you put a set screw from the top to uh, lock it, but the lateral wall is still able to move out because there is no head for the screw. You're right. So do you think that the we, next screw we, having a head is far better? In, yes, in yes. Always, always. We, we, we always use the uh, head screw when there is a small breach in the lateral wall. We use the cut washers. The cut okay. washer yeah. with the head. And that cut washer with the head, that cut washer, will, we can drop the cut washer on the guide pin at the cut and Do then I we pass the screw with the head but okay. when there is it is broken very badly the screw way, head will rest to the nail only the toggling the toggling the cannot the toggling toggling cannot be prevented sir okay. that is so then why we are not uh, the newer implants are having headless screws then all the pfn a2 zn because then. because they think that the heads are Probably when it come out, it may irritate the patient uh, skin on the lateral side. So they are doing for the different reason. But we have to have something to support on the lateral side. Uh, suppose you are fixing the uh, fracture neck femur and you are doing three cannulated screws. You always put a washer. Even the lateral wall is intact because you cannot compress without that. Here in the unstable fracture, there is a bone is broken I'm like this and you cannot compress charging because the collapse and the compression cannot coexist together biomechanically okay. when the fracture is collapsible fracture is not compressible when the fracture is compressible and compressed it cannot collapse so with 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 those concepts about instability and difficulties of inter uh, intertrochanteric fracture healing let us move on to the next lecture. Yes, complex, complicated yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Gaur is waiting for his talk on uh, complex, complicated fracture shaft of femur. So, please proceed, sir. We can see your presentation. Okay. 
So I uh, thank you, uh, Indian Alphabetic Association and uh, NAIS committee for giving me this opportunity to talk on complex, complicated fractures after the femur, um, a common fracture with the strongest bone when it breaks, uh, it causes problem. Winquist has classified this uh, from zero to four in five category and uh, the three and four where the contact between proximal and distal fragment is less than 50% or there is no contact, they are classified as complex fractures. You can treat them conservatively or operatively, but uh, as the literature of the last few years is showing, uh, the displaced or undisplaced fractures after the femur, uh, be it simple or complex, uh, given better outcome with the operative treatment. It's not that if you treat them conservatively, it will not unite. It does unite, but the patient has to be on traction in the bed and the functional problem is there, there may be shortening and things like that. It is also also not true that the standard treatment of interlocking nail will give uh, success. It has about 12% complication rate and uh, implant can break, fracture may not go into union because of other factors. So a large series uh, was published of 1300 uh, patients of uh, to see the outcome of fewer uh, shaft fractures. And uh, they have seen that uh, the success rate is more than 90%. However, in 10% of the patient, there were still uh, complications uh, like non-union, delayed union, infraction, and other factors. But they have uh, compared it with some other methodology like um, Anders nailing and plating and said that the gold standard is still intermedullary nailing locked. So this fracture, which is a uh, straightforward two-part fracture, the, uh, the treatment is standard um, uh, nailing, interlock nailing, and it gives a good result in maturity of the patients. What are the options? The options are nails, which are various types of nails. The plating, X-fix, obviously X-fix is used in compound fracture. Plating has gone out and nailing is, is still the commonest uh, mode of treatment of these complex fractures. So what are the issues? Static versus dynamic locking. If the fracture is transverse or short oblique, the dynamic locking can be done. Now the nails are available, which has dynamic hold distally also, uh, also approximately most of the nails have dynamic uh, locking. So the longer uh, the fragment uh, where you should use the dynamic locking and allow early weight bearing to have early union. However, in complex or comminuted fracture where there is a instability, the static locking or two proximal and two uh, distal is the principle. Timing of surgery is uh, uh, within 48 hours uh, as, a, as per the concept uh, as we have discussed earlier in this uh, webinar and uh, early surgery uh, is better uh, than uh, waiting later on. If you have a comminuted uh, fractures, uh, it is to stabilize with the kneeling, but there are fragments which are not actually reduced uh, well. And if you leave the gap in the fracture fragments, you are asking for trouble like this patient, the fracture did not unite even six months uh, post-op surgery. So what should have been done? I think, uh, open reduction and holding these fragments back into place will have uh, given uh, union much faster. Reduction techniques are very important and it's uh, very interesting how you use them and that's make uh, the surgeons different from each other. One achieves it uh, in an easier way, the other struggles it. 
You can use a supracondylar pin, as Dr. Gardigoni was showing for tibia. He uses calcaneum pin um, and put a long uh, bolus strip and attach to the traction device. Uh, I use uh, the fracture table for these fractures. Uh, the F tool is also an important uh, tool to keep uh, in the OT for uh, reduction or helping in the reduction of these accumulated fractures. Femoral distractor is a very useful device to help you in reduction. You can put one pin proximally, one distally, and then distract it. It for, gains the length, reduces uh, the fragment, makes your nailing easier. Butterfly fragment in a comminuted fracture, which one is significant, which is not significant? I think if there is no contact between proximal and distal fragment, as shown in this patient, there is no contact between proximal and distal, uh, you should think about open reduction. If the contact is less than 50%, then also open reduction will be better. If gap fracture gap is more than a centimeter and shortening more than 2.5 centimeter uh, between these. So all this is present in, in this case and is supported by the literature that it causes problem and causes a more uh, reoperation rate. So if you don't shrug from opening the fracture, reducing it well, and then dropping the nail, if, if there is instability, putting a plate over it. This is another patient where the split the fracture of the middle fragment is there, segmental fracture. A lot of gap is uh, left uh, between this, and it is asking for trouble. Uh, the fracture did not unite six months postoperatively, and there was some infection also. Obviously, pathological fracture, intermediary nailing is a standard procedure for palliative purposes, and uh, you can't use a plate. Now, I'll show you some cases. This is a lower third fracture extending supracondylar area where it was used, uh, retrograde nailing was used, as discussed with uh, Dr. Shivshankar. Um, but uh, supracondylar nail is coming back. But don't leave the gap in the, in the proximal part of the femur shaft. It takes a lot of uh, time and goes into delayed union. So if, since the canal is wide, the fixation is only subchondral in the distal part and in the proximal part. Middle part where the fracture is, if there is a gap, open it and uh, you can stabilize it such as wire. There's a lot of papers which have come up, uh, which are using uh, with open reduction, such as wire in anti-grade and retrograde nail, which helps into union. Um, Non-union is well known. We said that what to do if it fails to unite. The three simple principles, whether it is vital or avital, whether it is septic or aseptic, how is the condition of soft tissue? They determine how you deal with these failed fractures. And you learn from each failed fracture what proper treatment should have been done in previous scenarios. This 28-year diabetic uh, patient uh, had a septic, aseptic, avital. Initially, he had sepsis. He was treated by various um, uh, treatment, like first femur interlock, then femur interlock was removed, External fixator was put in, femur plate, fibular, femur plate and fibular graft was given, and then removal of the plate was done. And this was the condition he presented to us. Now, Dr. Tanna has talked about uh, this uh, augmentation plating, supplementary plating. And I think uh, we are moving from more movement, a biological movement, to more rigidity when we treat non-union scenario. Whether it will be true in initial scenario or not, I don't know. But this patient who was four years old, multiple surgeries, exchange nailing and a supplementary plate was put on, 
and has gone into beautiful union. So if it works in non-union scenario, it should work in fresh fractal, but yes, you have to select the patient. This is a atrophic type, aseptic, avital, 55 year, three years back, atrophic non-union with broken implant. Exchange nailing and augmentation plating with the bone grafting since it was a vital was done and it has gone into union. This is a 15 year old patient where K nail was done. It is uh, hypertrophic of the non union, the implant is broken. A nailing and clock nailing was done with the supplementary plate and it has gone into a non union. In patients who present to you late, their medullary cavity is very wide. And we don't have the nails to stabilize it. We don't have the nail more than 12 generally available. So you have to supplement with some other plate to augment it because nail will not with adequate stability. So in this scenario, later when the patient presents to you, a supplementing the plate is a good idea and it gives you union. This is a complex fracture which is put in with the interlock nail, essentially wire. There is still instability and uh, the screws broken and all. And uh, exchange nailing was done with a supplementary plate was put on and it gone into union, although there was some shortening remaining. So we have published a paper uh, from Bhopal in 2017, augmentation plating in management of failed femoral nailing. Uh, and uh, it has shown that uh, supplementing the plate over a nail uh, is a good idea in failed femoral nailing patients. Uh, operative treatment of femoral shaft non union also said that stability is important for uh, these. Um, Fewer shaft fractures, uh, non-union, uh, the uh, stability as well as uh, the vitality both are important. So just to sum up, history is very interesting of each case and important in the management of female shaft fractures. You learn from each case why it has failed so that you don't do it next time. Prognosis of fracture not only associated with bony problems, but largely uh, this one to your soft part or around the fracture, soft tissue is also important. Intermediary interlock nailing is still the golden standard in complex fracture, although uh, some percent of the patient uh, does not go into complete union and function. Exchange nailing is effective, but it's better than uh, bone grafting when you do it in each and few months of the fracture delayed union. Augmentation plate is effective in femoral shaft non-union treatment. Don't leave the fracture gap if required. Don't hesitate in open reduction of fixation. And I, I think this is a very important concept which is coming up, that we had gone to close, close, close. Now you have to close open. Uh, both, both things should be done in an individual case. Successful surgeon is the one who not only learns from his own mistakes, but also from others' mistakes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gore, sir. That was a wonderful presentation. Sir, I have a uh, query about this. What you prefer uh, in the non-union, either the exchange nailing or plate augmentation? Gore, sir, please unshare your screen. Uh, I'll answer your question. No, you have to. Uh, you have to put put both. You have to do an exchange nailing, nailing and then uh, supplement it, if possible. If the fracture is allowing, you extend it to one of the corners, like superior to cantic area, or if it is lower third, you put it to condylar area, uh, plating. So alone plating will not work. And sir, what you decide uh, whether you have to bone graft at that uh, time during application of the plate or uh, it, it will suffice without bone graft? It is pre op uh, decision. When on a tray, you see whether it is a vital or a vital. If it is vital, you don't need it. 
If it is a vital, you need it. The other thing I will uh, tell you is another point is when to supplement initially or later on. When you fix the fracture with a nail, and if the fracture site is open or you have opened it for bone grafting, you rotate it. If there is some rotation at the fracture site, that is the time when you must put a plate, otherwise it will fail. If there is no movement, you can get away by the nail only, actually nail, thicker. So the only nail and interlock may not give the stability. Again, there yeah. is an invisible instability, rotational instability. That yeah. you have to take care by the another implant. Ex exactly. And particularly with the osteoporotic patients, always span from greater trochanter to lateral condyle fully. Otherwise, there will be a stress fracture. Yesterday, we saw the example in the indoor, uh, Dr. N Nina. Negi, Negi. No, not Negi. Nina, Ma, Nima. 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 Huh. He presented a case where in an osteoporotic patient, he did a fixation. Then there was a fracture at the end. Then again, he added a plate. Then there was a fracture again at that end. Then again, he did a plate and he kept the uh, space between. Third time, it was fractured. So, you have to span fully in the uh, with the nail and the plate. Yeah. When you are in doubt in the osteoporotic fracture. Sir, what, what should be the protocol if there is a non-union in an interlocking nail and you have to go for the exchange nailing the, and it is a closed procedure. So now you how you decide there is an instability, invisible instability and you have to put or augment the plate on it. Yes, that's yes. What, that's, what I said, that's what I said. That if, if, if it is going to... Uh, Delayed union non union scenario, like I've shown you four years, 15 years, no, like six months, eight months down the line. You exchange it, put two, you ream it, uh, minimum two millimeter more. You put the nail, minimum 1.5 millimeter more. Once you have logged it statically, both sides, you rotate it. And what Naveen is saying, there is invisible instability. You can see between two fragments that it is moving. At that time, you must supplement it to give more stability. Otherwise, I think, I, I think Dr. Santos is asking how to know when he is doing a close XA nailing whether there is a rotational movement occurring or not. That you have to shoot dynamically on the CR. Yeah. And you have to see the matching of the cortex yeah. while doing a, dy a dynamic rotational mm -hmm. stability. If you will, the thickness of the cortex is changing, then there is a movement. True. True. You have to see the thickness of the cortex. You can see only the thickness of the... Uh, many times you may not see the gross movements, but you have to see the thickness of the CM. So could, it, could, could it has been uh, neutralized? The more, the fixation more, important, in the more important dictum is when you are in doubt, you support extra. There is no problem of overkilling, little bit overkilling. No, no. I, I want to ask, sir, if you fix uh, the distal part of the nail in two directions, then it's still there where there will be invisible instability. Now, what, what is your experience now? In, in, a, in, a, in a combinated fracture soft, in a supraisthmal fracture and an infraisthmal fracture, with the combination always requires the extra stability. Alone nail does not work. And we have to do a secondary procedure. So you can do primarily nail and plate together if you feel like that. In a combinated soft, yeah. in a subtrop fracture where there is a combination, there is a medially combination. So only nail will not work and you do not have that much proximal screw fixation which gives the rotation stability. And many times you are not putting anteroposterior screw in the distal part because multi-locking is there in the three three screws lateral to medial. That is the same direction, but it should be multi-plane. So you have to put the anteroposterior screw in the distal fragment. Then and then it will give a multi-plane fixation. Yeah. Probably in a good bone quality and you have a good contact, without the plate it may work. But you have to take care in the follow-up, check that whether it is uniting, is there is a movement in the screw, Toggling of the screw will give the 
rise to the increasing the size of that hole and there you come to know there is a instability that is again a sign in the fall off that whatever hole you have made on the toggling that hole becomes little larger in the your uh, uh, cortex you see there you that is a sign of instability again because some movement is occurring at the interlocking level thank you sir and now the time for the last presentation by dr rm chandak sir sir you are welcome and you have already shared your screen so please start your talk sir yeah thank you very much after those wonderful lectures on difficult nailing procedures uh, i'll be speaking on uh, inevitable sometimes happening complication a dreaded complication all of us in orthopedics always we fear about and that is early infection after a nailing how to diagnose and what intervention we can do so surgical site infections we can encounter pathogens which are either endogenous from the patient's own flora skin and the surrounding skin etc or a exogenous seeding of the bacteria during the surgical procedure we may have a infection which occurs early within 30 days of the procedure or occurs between 1 and 3 months or presents more than 3 months after surgery the guidelines and surgical management of all uh, in this situations would probably differ the cdc classification suggests a surgical site infection can happen in the skin subcutaneous tissue or in the deep tissue or including even the organ space or the fixations how do we diagnose a surgical site infection occurring early after a nailing procedure it would be with the classical um, signs like redness swelling wound drainage chills high grade fever the investigations we will have to do in this case are routine but i would what i would like to draw your attention is the most important fact is a clinical diagnosis a patient who is not doing well usually second day patient has lot of pain after the procedure but the third day he usually settles down completely and his requirement of analgesics etc go down but when he is not doing well he is throwing fever we have to look into the cause of his fever whether it is arising from any other cause apart from the surgical site look at the wound and if any doubt we have to take action the radionuclide scan i have not yet done in our own setups however in the literature that has been given as a good tool the role of mri is again doubtful very rarely we would do a ct scan in this patient the most important diagnosis remains is blood parameters markers and the clinical diagnosis usually the infection setting happens within usually 4 to 5 days of the surgical procedure except in the necrotizing infections caused by either streptococcus which presents within a day or clostridial infections very up to which is again a very very serious condition the whenever there is a infection and it is simple erythema beyond the bone we would always start with initially the drain continues drainage and antibiotic if it is just confined to skin subcutaneous tissue or is small stitch abscess not any other uh, parameters to suggest a deep infection then possibly draining that and uh, taking care of the wound care if it is very superficial but whenever there be wherever we are suspecting a deep infection a uh, surgical site deep infection it has to be a suspicion and we explore the wound wash lavage the whole thing so that the biofilms does not, do not form and we remove all the detritus tissue hematoma drain it and even in case required we may put a wax solution the whole wound has to be laid open completely washed many times we may not find a active pus formation but usually there is lot of edema all slough devitalized tissue has to be taken out the wound has to be laid open completely it is not just a miniature opening and that is usually rewarding which would avoid a long term infection to this patient the other wounds even in the vicinity of the primary fixation can also be taken care of in the simultaneous setting this is a case of a young male who came after his surgery done a month back had a fixation and 
started pouring pus from the distal interlocking side and had a fluorid course, was running fever in the post-op period. He was given antibiotics, 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 but he was not settling. That was explored. The whole wound was explored complete. Uh, since the whole medullary cavity, proximal interlocking side, distal interlocking side, everything had pus. We had to take out his implant, remove that, put antibiotic nail even in the early phase. Usually in the early phase when the fixation is good, we would retain the implant. However, in this specific case, I had to remove the implant as the whole cavity was full of pus. And then we had done a two-stage procedure for this patient. Usually when we replace that with an antibiotic nail, I would usually use a four gram of vancomycin and either gentamicin, amikacin uh, powder along with uh, the vancomycin to give a good antibiotic elution. However, in the very early phase of infection, we would usually open the wound completely and debride the wound. This was another case who came from a hospital already operated for a fracture shaft femur and the surgeon had done an open nailing procedure in a comminuted fragment where the middle fragment was actually topsy-turvy. He did a complete open procedure and had a, a nailing. The patient on the day of star, uh, stitches removal uh, had a, a very nasty discharging uh, pus, was having high-grade fever as well. And that patient, we had to use a negative pressure wound therapy to take care of his wound condition along with local measures. So that wound was completely debrided. The whole, whole stitch line was uh, opened. Uh, negative pressure wound therapy was instituted first as an open uh, vac and then with the vacuum assisted closure method and that patient did well and his wounds healed over a period of around two to three weeks and the healing also subsequently proceeded very well for that patient. This patient had after nailing at my own center had extreme pain, swelling, induration and fever as well and as we can see on the suture line uh, there was a lot of edema etc and his platelet counts also were quite low. The drain site also had a thick clot and exploration revealed a lot of clots in the wound. He required hematologic management along with wound management. And then this patient also healed well and his wound settled down over a period of weeks. Uh, so friends, when we explore these wounds early, take care of the wound surrounding edema, provide them appropriate antibiotics, there will be a good healing. In the early post-op phase, my appeal would be whenever you find a, even a small pus or a wound not doing well, it is always better to appropriately give them antibiotic cover, explore the wound, wash, lavage, debride, complete uh, wound management and if required a negative pressure wound therapy, that would give us a good healing. So we consider whenever this patient have fever, not doing well, all these factors to take a, get a good result. Not only the wound management, along with that, the complete holistic management of the patient would be very important. And we must evaluate all the risk factors to take care of infection, which are very, very vital in our rounds when we take their history and take care of other associated factors. If there are deficiencies, deficiency of protein, uh, vitamins, etc., th those also should be taken care of along with supplementation and wound care. In summary, what I would like to say, Whenever we suspect early infection after a nailing procedure, have a high index of suspicion. That is one very important factor along with your investigation. Explore early. Thorough debridement is actually the key with appropriate antibiotics so that we give a good healing to our patient. With our aim of giving complete infection eradication, which is possible with early exploration, if the wound continues to have smoldering infection with antibiotic cover, they would manifest with a complete infection of the medullary cavity later on. So, do a complete initial early debrima. Our goal would be achieved when we control the infection and the infection eradication is possible if we intervene early. If we intervene later on, the infection becomes established and then that is just a control of infection. And if we take care of this and if this stable fixation is there, we would usually achieve union. Simultaneously, we also have to look into the soft tissue management 
joint contractures and mobilization of the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellent, Chandak sir. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Chandak, before you, you talked about hair removal, but I just want to reiterate that point because you just made one point only in that slide. Definitely, earlier we were doing hair removal a day earlier or two days earlier and the patient was not coming on the OT table in the as per the plan and the infection chances were very, very high. And uh, it's uh, now I have made it a routine that either if the shaving is required, it will be done only after a patient is anesthetized, that too, only the part which comes in the way. Otherwise, shaving is not done routinely nowadays and the, definitely the infection chances has come down because yes. when the shaving is done, there are minor scratches which happens and that is a potent place for the infection to happen. And uh, many a time, the routine everywhere is to prepare the part. They just write prepare the part and the patient may not come on the next or in the next 48 hours into the OT and that gets infected. Yes. Absolutely right, sir. We remember those days in medical colleges where a barber used to be there for yes. uh, pre-operative day yes, planning. Yes. That has all gone now. So there are so many things in preventing uh, the, surgical site infection. Yeah. There, there is a there is a particular condition, uh, uh, sir, that many times we get the discharge and we are worried for the infection, but it is not really an infection. So Possibly so a only on, only distinction between the discharge which is painful is usually infection. When it is a painless, mostly it is another reason of hypoproteinemia, fat necrosis, or a platelet dysfunction, and we, which is leading to a problem. In one of your case, you have shown that there was a, some hematological problem. That is a platelet count is okay, but the platelet function is a problem many times. And so, there you get and you explore it and you found that there is no infection. So, Dr. Godgone, I must, uh, Dr. Godgone, I must uh, thank you and uh, uh, appreciate your hard work on the book getting OT is my temple. And yes. Dr. Chandak, I'm thankful to you. I have read your both the topics, essential adjunct and bailout instrument in OT. It was a beautiful, beautiful written, sir. Uh, I must thank you to you for this, uh, providing me this booklet. And uh, I request you to further write down the same things which are very helpful to a general uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon. Thank you. Santosh ji, we have done a series of webinar for this. Series of webinars. Sir, sir, it was a beautiful book. So it, it was a great effort by Dr. Gargone, sir. And at this point, I must congratulate to both of you. Thank you so much. And this book has been uh, published in the IACON uh, inauguration, sir. It is yeah, I, I, I have seen at that time, but later on, I have received from Dr. Gargone. Okay, and I, have, okay. I, I have read it. It is a very beautiful book, sir. Very well compiled. Sir. And if you see the all the webinars recorded, you will come into the more and more details, practical with the photographs and everything. Dr. Chandra has done a lot of work on that. Yes. So, with this, I think uh, we have come to an end of the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, Chandak, sir. Yeah. Chandak, sir, good. next episode is on upper extremity complexity of nailing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that is the theme. Uh, Navin, bye. Yes. Uh, our theme will be in the next webinar, Complex Cities of Nailing in Upper Extremity. It, okay. will, be, it will be a very debatable, sir, in Upper Level. <laughs> 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 oh, debatable to Raina Chiena, debatable. Yes. So I thank all participants, especially Chandak, sir, Shivshankar, sir, Santosh Singh, uh, Navin Bhai, and all uh, these faculty members, Navin, Navin Bhai, Trika, sir, Ajit Kumar. Uh, Sivshankar especially is helping me all the way uh, and uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gaur and these are all faculty members they have done extremely today and probably it will be much more helpful to them. 
so in concluding remarks santosh singh you say thank to all and uh, will you have a good bye but it was it was a pleasure to be here with uh, you all learned people i have learned a lot from this webinar <laughs> and i am thankful to the io and uh, dr vivek trikha as such and my mentor dr shiv shankar sir thank you for so much and i thanks to all the faculties we will meet soon okay. thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you bye bye shiv shankar ye jet jet viman hai private jet hai kya लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग इज स्टिल कंटिन्यूड Yes, yes, it is continuing. So, okay. Uh, yes, can I go now, sir? I think we can exit ourselves. It will become automatically. <laughs>